lecture. We've hopefully got everybody here who we're expecting. We have got a number of apologies. Um, it is on. It's on. Okay. I'll start shouting at you. How's that? <laughs> oh, goodness me. Right. I'll reverse that. Good afternoon for those at the far end who can't hear me. <laughs> it's probably just as well, actually. Right. Okay. So I'll just go through the apologies to start with. Um, we have. Can Sorry. <laughs> right. We have um, apologies from Councillor Payne, Mark Shelford. James Mason um, and Councillor May was tentative. I think he's now sent his apologies. Right, okay. Any other apologies from anybody? No? Okay. Right. And I have to say, I actually can't possibly read the nameplates at the far end of the room. So it's going to be you. I think I can see you down there. So please don't take it the wrong way. And we're also having the grass cut from the side of it. It's going to be one of those days. Oh. It's going to get very warm in here. It will. I think we'll make sure we build in a break because I think it is going to get quite warm in here and you might want to open a window and walk about a bit but if they're cutting the grass we won't be able to hear anything with that going on so right um okay so i'm going to pass over to simon for the emergency evacuation measures thank you chair uh, good afternoon members uh, we're not expecting um a fire alarm practice this morning or this afternoon but if it does actuate and then if you can leave the room via the exit signs with a, a green uh, person above each door, so one behind me uh, and one just in front of me, and uh, that will make your way outside the building and we'll congregate out into the front uh, car park uh, for a roll call. Thank you. Quickest thing to do is just follow Simon. <laughs> then we know where we are. Yeah. Right, OK. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Amanda, our, our clerk, for declarations of interest. Thank you, Chair. Um, so there's two declarations of interest to, to, for today's meeting. So members collectively have an interest in relation to paper number nine, which is a refresh of your members' allowances scheme. And you'll see later that we've had a review of that scheme. So you're all interested in that paper. And then the Chief Fire Officer and members of the Service Leadership Board, who are paid a percentage of the Chief Fire Officer's salary, have all declared an interest in paper number 13, which is the annual review of remuneration of the Chief Fire Officer, Chief Executive. Thank you. And item four, we have one public access statement from a member of the public, which I think the clerk is going to read out for us. Yes, thank you, Chair. So Chairman, I... could I just actually make the point? If a member of the public's not here, it does seem to be ridiculous for us to use time. We've actually had it electronically. We have a paper copy here. Can't we just accept it? Uh, I'm happy for that to be put to members, if that's how they were happy to proceed. I do want to read a response to that statement as well, because you've all seen the public access statement. So are members content for me to move straight to the response? Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. So if I hand over now to the Statutory Finance Officer, because a lot of that was about financial matters, so Verity will deal with the first part of the public access statement. Okay, thank you. So the service thanks Ms Gwynne for her public access statement. I, as Statutory Finance Officer, will respond to the financial aspects. Ms Gwynne raises questions around a provision made in prior years for some interim work required at the Bedminster Fire Station. We have previously responded to similar queries by email on the 8th of August 2023 during the public inspection period for the 22-23 financial statements. The £203,000 provision remains within the accounts um, as at the 31st of March 2023 and has been audited as part of the external audit procedures completed on those financial statements. 
This provision will be released during the 23-24 uh, financial year, which is the same year that the refurbishment work commenced at the Bedminster Fire Station. At uh, the March 2019 Fire Authority meeting, pre-construction spends for both the Bath and Western Fire Stations were approved at £500,000 and £420,000 respectively. The service has currently spent just over half of the approved allowance for Bath on work completed um, up to the end of River Stage 3 and also on exploring um, other options for collaboration with emergency services and to avoid potential future costs. There will be further pre-construction works and associated costs as the service progresses through Reba Stage 3 and 4. The service has spent around £200,000 to date on pre-construction work for the Western Station, covering explora exploration of site disposal and alternative locations, retaining land and the options around rebuilding or refurbishing the station. There will be further pre-construction work and associated costs as the service progresses through Reba Stages 2, 3 and 4 associated with the Western refurbishment. The costs allocated within the proposed capital programme represent the current expected costs of construction for the works at both Bath and Western, and include allowances for both construction and non-construction costs. The non-construction costs uh, can be attributed to things like design work, consultancy costs, service, um, surveys and other professional fees. The service continues to work through the design stages of both sites, so the split of the total cost between construction and non-construction is not yet finalised. Detailed papers will be brought to the July meeting of the Policy and Resources Committee to request approval to proceed with each of these projects. Once approval to proceed is granted, our procurement department and premises team will conduct a tender process to ensure value for money to the authority. I'll now hand back over to our clerk uh, to address the remaining aspects within the statement. Thank you, Dorothy. So dealing with the, the remaining aspects of the public access statement, Ms Gwynne has again raised a capital expenditure of 765000 related to Temple Back. She is att attempting to reopen a matter which has been fully investigated by two firms of auditors and the court found no evidence of fault or flaws in those two independent investigations and accepted the findings of the auditors. Her request for documents made in June 2020 has been reviewed by the Information Commissioner. She appealed the Information Commissioner's decision to the First Tier Tribunal, Information Rights, and that tribunal heard detailed evidence and refused her appeal on 30th November 2022, citing that the appellant's persistent contact with the Fire Authority has the effect of causing harassment and distress. The judgment is available online. The service therefore considered this matter closed and will not be responding to any further comments about the topics covered by that judgment. Finally, Ms Gwynne's comments about the Chief Fire Officer's uh, NJC Pay Award are addressed by Paper 13, which is in your agenda today. Thank you. Chairman, could I, with respect and through you, just make a point for future reference? Um, most of our councils have a policy. If um, questions are tabled by a member of the subject, they can ask those questions or the responses will be at the meeting. But statements are usually responded to in the future, not in public session. Uh, and certainly this individual, longer standing members such as myself <coughs> will recognise she has a certain reputation for some vexatious uh, questioning. Uh, so I would suggest for future good practice, it would be deemed to be better to write to her copy to all members. Is, would that be helpful? Uh, Councillor, thank you for your suggestion. We'll take that away. Uh, I think we need to review at regular intervals the public access policy. So I'll take those comments on board. Thank you. Thank you for that. And the still under public access, we've received a statement from the Fire Brigade Union who've requested to read this out at the meeting. Um, I think Dave Roberts is going to do that. Chair, members, uh, good afternoon. My name is Dave Roberts and I'm the Regional Secretary for the Fire Brigade Union here in the, here in the South West. The Fire Brigade Union, we uphold the decision of this fire authority in its, last four mil in its last four meeting to delay the decision to downgrade the crewing model on whole-time fire appliances. The role of this fire authority 
is to provide governance oversight for Avon Fire and Rescue Service. While providing a balanced budget is one key area, there are many other areas which this fire authority must ensure. Adequate resources, training, effectiveness at incidents, ongoing recruitment that garners diversity and equality, and most importantly, that the staff of Avon Fire and Rescue Service go home safe to their families at the end of a shift. While some may view this delay as kicking the can down the road or delaying the inevitable, if this authority decides to accept option two today, it buys you one of the most crucial commodities, time. Time for Avon Fire and Rescue Service to explore fully if and where efficiency can be made safely. Time to lobby MPs, the Fire Minister, or more appropriately the Shadow Fire Minister, to secure appropriate funding for Avon moving forward. I will personally stand side by side in the halls of Westminster with any officer or member of this authority in seeking the funding that Avon desperately needs to provide an effective fire service to the public. Uh, I, I note that the Police and Crime Commissioner isn't here today, um, but I'm sure the, uh, the Police and Crime Commissioner could provide valuable insight into the rationale behind central government providing additional funding to constabularies, um, enabling the recruitment of 20,000 more officers um, when they are on the brink of ineffectiveness. Um, the Chancellor announced recently that the spending review will be looking at provision of upfront investment in public services to stop cuts in the services that are valued by the public. Therefore, the door is open. At your last meeting, you passed on your respects and good wishes to the firefighter that was seriously injured at an incident. An incident they were part of a crew of four. Whilst it cannot be proven that a crew of five would have averted this serious injury in its entirety, <coughs> A prudential risk-based approach would dictate that risk information gathering, situational awareness and the potential for breathing apparatus entry control procedures would have provided significant control measures and mitigate the risk of danger. It is a sombre fact that in the history of the fire service, reform most often comes at the expense of a firefighter's life, otherwise known as tombstone legislation. The Smithfield Meat Market in 1958 in which two firefighters lost their lives, led to the introduction of breathing apparatus entry control boards. Blainer in Gwent in 1996, where two firefighters lost their lives in a backdraft. They were part of a crew of four. Upon receipt of the information that there was a child in the property, they entered under what we now know as rapid deployment. Firefighters feel a moral obligation at certain incidents to act immediately where life is threatened, and rescues are required. It is essential to avoid situations which could motivate or pressurise firefighters to act unsafely in the interest of saving lives. Rapid deployment is a tactic to be used in extenuating circumstances and not a standard practice. Firefighters have an unwritten covenant with society, an unspoken agreement that their daily courage will be recognised by those they protect. Firefighters agree to put themselves at risk to rescue others, but in return, they expect their employers and the general public to acknowledge and value their unique contribution and to be able to access the best possible equipment, training and resources. In summary, Avon Fire Authority needs to step back from the brink and source additional funding from this government or any subsequent governments to ensure the safety of the public that we serve. Downgrading the establishment now and in the future will be a race to the bottom that will put lives on the line. Thank you. Thank you for your statement and I think <coughs> the Chief Fire Officer will now respond. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to thank the FBU for their statement and ongoing engagement with the service, which remains positive and extend and continue to extend an invite for these to continue. In October 2023, I presented to the members of the Fire Authority proposals which involve changes to the resourcing structures and staffing levels to meet the predicted and realistic funding deficit over the period of the medium-term financial plan. That paper was proposed to the Fire Authority and members voted in favour of the continued development and implementation of a four-person crew model, 
with the exception of Hicksgate Fire Station, subject to any unforeseen risks to service delivery to the public or firefighters and subject to changes in the funding position. With progress on the development and implementation to be reported to the Policy and Resources Committee uh, meeting in December 2023. During the autumn of 2023, I wrote to MPs and the Secretary of State to, uh, Secretaries of State to seek appropriate funding for Avon Fire and Rescue Service and greater preset flexibility to meet our future funding requirements. This was also undertaken by other Chief Officers for their services and also the National Fire Chiefs Council. The proposed efficiency plans were reviewed by members of the Policy and Resources Committee in December following further clarity on the single year revenue support grant and preset flexibility following announcement by central government. Members reviewed evidence of trials at Hicksgate Station attended by the FBU. The data from those trials found that using four, five, five, four firefights on appliance can be achieved with a safe system of work and will not have a negative impact on the services response standards. The committee therefore resolved to note the continued development towards the implementation of a four-person crew model. Alongside the statutory finance officer, I have carefully managed the revenue budget to balance resources to meet the needs of the authority, including investments to respond to areas of improvement identified through inspection reports. This includes the use of reserves and capital provisions to avoid the need for capital borrowing while still maintaining a capital replacement programme, including the rebuild of Avonmar Fire Station, refurbishment of Bedminster Fire Station, significant investment in fire stations at Bath and Western Supermare, and improvements in other um, estates. Maintenance of a rolling three, uh, fleet replacement programme for new state-of-the-art Volvo appliances replacement of specialist appliances and some of the best operational equipment available, to name but a few. If the authority wishes to maintain its ambitions in its capital replacement programme for buildings and appliances, then the revenue budget will not support this ambition without a capital replacement financial plan. I support the FBU's position of needing time, as the efficiency plans put before you give the authority exactly that, time. Time to implement changes in a progressive and managed approach through natural reductions in establishment. To implement a crewing model that is not new ground, a crewing model that the service operated during COVID and operates in many other services around the country. A crewing model that through re reality testing, evidence and research observed by the FBU has not compromised the safety of firefighters or the safety of our communities where a safe system of work can be adopted. The proposed changes may not meet all future funding deficits, but without the time to manage and adopt the changes, there remains a greater risk of harder hitting, greater impact and severe changes needed in a shorter space of time. I am very pleased to report that the firefighter who was injured at, op at the operational incident earlier in the year is making an excellent recovery, and I have personally passed on your best wishes. The Fire Brigade Union are correct. The matter of resourcing was not a factor, as both the fire investigation report and accident investigation do not suggest the response or staffing levels were a contributory factor. Moreover, moreover other aspects gave, gave rise to the outcome. I have been a firefighter for over 30 years, and I agree with my colleagues in the FBU that they do an incredible job in keeping our communities safe every day, and I am immensely proud to be their Chief Fire Officer. I now have the privilege to work alongside incredible and dedicated teams. The role of a firefighter can be hazardous, but that is why we need the best equipment, the best PPE, the best appliances and buildings. It is why we have some of the safest procedures and tra uh, training and policies in the world, substantiated by national operational guidance and fire standards. The authority will be presented with a capital programme today, which is directly linked to the health and safety of our firefighters and staff, contributory to organisational culture, staff morale, their well-being, their dignity, their welfare and also uh, uh, workplace <coughs> attendance. They cannot be taken in isolation, but all contributing to achieving the authorities' commitments to making our community safer and our service stronger. I welcome uh, the support of the FBU's position in a sustainable funding model which allows investment in the fire service. But the reality is, that we have a funding pressures that we must address now, and my and the statutory finance officer's duty is to present proposals to you to achieve a balanced budget now and into the future. Thank you. Thank you, and that concludes the public access statements. I'd now like to go back to welcoming everybody.
and also to confirm for the benefit of the recording that this fire authority meeting is taking place at police and fire headquarters in Portishead. We are also recording the meeting for the public to view on the Fire Authority YouTube channel. And I'd like to ask members to introduce themselves so the people watching at home, your vast audience, I'm sure, would like to know who you all are. I'll start myself. My name is Brenda Massey. I'm currently chair of the authority and I'm a councillor in Bristol. I'll go around. Sorry, I can never tell which way you're going to go, Chair, but um, hi, I'm Councillor Ben Nutland, Councillor for Yate North, Vice Chair of the Avon Fire Authority. I'm Ron Hardy, uh, Councillor for Emerson's Great in, uh, in South Gloucester. Uh, Robin Moss, I'm Councillor for Westfield in Bath and North East Somerset. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Councillor Matthew Riddle, and I'm a member of South Gloucestershire Council representing the Severn Vale Ward. Thank you. Afternoon, Richard Tucker, uh, Western Supermare, Milton Ward, North Somerset Council. Afternoon, <laughs> Councillor Onkar Theni from Bath and North East Somerset. Thank you. Councillor Martin Williams, North Somerset Council, Cusack Ward, West Supermare. Councillor Jane Stansfield, South Gloucestershire Council, Thornbury Ward. Uh, David Wilcox, representing Lockleys in the fine city and county of Bristol. Uh, Councillor Yassin Mahmoud, Lawrence Hill, Bristol City Council. Councillor Dan Thomas, Kongsby and Puxton on North Somerset Council. Councillor Philippa Hume, representing Hawfield Ward in Bristol. Hi, Councillor Steve Smith, representing Westbury on Trim and Henley Easy in Bristol. Councillor Giovanni, Brisington West, Bristol City Council. Councillor Liz Brennan for French Hain Down and South Gloucestershire. Councillor Richard Eddy, Bishops of Bristol, which sadly isn't in North Somerset. <laughs> uh, Councillor Paul Goggin, representing Hartcliffe and Willywood Ward, uh, Bristol City Council. Thank you. And can I ask officers to introduce themselves so we go round the opposite way this time? Good chair, good afternoon, members, ladies and gentlemen. Simon Shilton, your Chief Forest and Chief Exec. Yeah, good afternoon, Steve Imry, one of the Assistant Chief Forest Officers. Good afternoon, Richard Welch, the other Assistant Chief Fire Officer. Good afternoon, Emma Bowen, Democratic Services. Good afternoon, Caroline Taylor, Head of Corporate Assurance, Continuous Improvement and Planning. Good afternoon, Amber Foreman, Head of Corporate Communications. Good afternoon, Scott Ward, Corporate Assurance and Business Planning Manager. Good afternoon, Natalie Mainstone, I work in Risk Management. Good afternoon, Lee Alford. Station Manager, Risk Management. Good afternoon, Claire Bentley, Head of Finance. Good afternoon, Angie Feeney, your Director of Corporate Services here at Avon Fire and Rescue Service. Good afternoon, I'm Verity Lee, Statutory Finance Officer. And good afternoon, I'm Amanda Brown, I'm Clerk to Avon Fire Authority. Thank you. And um, for the benefit of the recording, could I ask the members of the FBU to leave it to say your names, please? Executive Council Member for the South West Region of the Fire Brigade Union. Uh, Dave Roberts, Regional Secretary for the Fire Brigade Union. Amanda Mills, Brigade Secretary for Avon. Thank you. And I think we've covered everybody now. Mm -hmm. Yep, good. Can I remind you, please, put your phone onto silent, just in case. Richard? It is getting a little warm. <laughs> and that's, that's before we start the meeting, it's getting warm, so yes. Right, while, while that's happening, I'll just um, remind you also to use the microphones when you're speaking and to remember to turn them off. I know if I forget mine, I should get slapped by Amanda. She hits the button. So if you don't want that to happen, make sure you turn them off. <laughs> right. Any voting required today will take place by asking members for a show of hands. 
any vote in the order of any votes against, any abstentions and any votes for. I'm now handing back over to Amanda. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to let everyone know that the Fire Authority has now published its pre-election guidance. That remains in place until the polls close on the 2nd of May. As you will know, elections are taking place in Bristol City Council and for the role of Avon and Somerset Police and Crime Commissioner. Um, members and officers are encouraged to read the guidance, which I emailed to everyone, or Emma emailed on my behalf, on, the 5th, on Friday the 15th of March. Uh, please can we all act in accordance with it? Uh, fire authority meetings will continue to deal with the day-to-day -day business for the fire authority, so we shouldn't be affected by this. Thank you. Thank you. And just uh, before we start the main business of the meeting, last week... Um, our Vice Chair Ben and Simon, our Chief Fire Officer and I, all attended the uh, LGA Fire Conference, which was actually held in Bristol for once. Um, and I just wanted to comment, because I know we've got a lot on the agenda, but I thought it was appropriate to say how much I enjoyed the session given by one of our, peop our officers about contamination. Yes, Luke, that's right, about contamination. And it was really, really interesting. Um, and it was great to go and meet up with people from other areas too. Well, I don't know if Simon or Ben want to add anything to that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, it was uh, really informative. And actually, um, I, it was Luke Gazard that gave a, an excellent session on contaminants. Um, Luke just not only showed his knowledge of the subject area but just how professional he is um, and it was also extremely enlightening that actually everyone in the fire sector whether it's officers or fire team members, the FBU were all pulling in the same direction in terms of how we wish to see the future of fire developed in this country so it's, it's, it's very exciting to see what's going to happen over the next 12 months and uh, what's happening locally and nationally Yeah, it's uh, echo um, what the chair and vice chair uh, said there. It's a, a lot of interesting topics, um, uh, some really good sessions, not also about the contaminants, one about culture and the challenges uh, that the sector is facing around culture in, the, in, the, uh, in all of the services as well. Some very, very powerful speakers, um, very, uh, you know, some really compelling stories they had to tell as well, uh, which certainly sort of uh, pulled some heartstrings for myself, uh, definitely, um, with the challenge that, uh, you know, working together uh, that we can solve uh, collectively. Um, and also, um, just linked to uh, previous uh, statements, a um, lot of conversation around uh, funding uh, in the sector as well, and appropriate funding, uh, not just for our own organisation, but for the for fire sector as a whole. Um, and there are a number of questions. We were joined by the Shadow Fire Minister. Sadly, the Fire Minister couldn't um, join us on that day, uh, but certainly we were joined by the Shadow Fire Minister, uh, where the matter of funding for the Fire Ministry Service was a, was a key topic of conversation. But nevertheless, uh, a very thoroughly um, uh, enjoyable two days, very informative uh, for members uh, and officers as well. Thank you. And at the dinner in the evening afterwards, I have to say that the chair managed, to, yes. the chief fire officer managed to take quite a few steps backwards, <laughs> leaving me to welcome everybody to the meeting. But I, ha I haven't forgotten. Yes. yes. Can I just add one more thing? As, as it was based in, based in Bristol, we had a lot of officers that gave up time to actually help the event function, um, and I would like, hopefully, that every member on the safari can pass on our thanks through the Chief <coughs> Fire Officer for everything that they did to make a, a, such a worthy event. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. I think um, credit goes to the corporate comms team and Olivia who sat at the back there, who was one of the main coordinators for pulling all of our support to the, to the LGA conference. So. Uh, um, please take the credit. Olivia did a fantastic job, and for all the staff that were there, and there was other people in the room as well who, who represented our organisation at the highest level, and uh, extra incredibly proud of them. So thank you. And the little torches to go on your key ring are a great invention. I had to get something out of it. <laughs> right, moving on again. Um, the Fire Authority AGM will take place on the 12th of June which should allow the unitary authorities sufficient time to nominate new members to the fire authority. And an induction event will take place for new members on the 7th of June at headquarters. So, this...
take over. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, I want to take this opportunity to say a few words. Um, we know that uh, local lectures are, are, are taking place um, in Bristol, um, so this will be uh, possibly uh, some members' last uh, time with the authority. Uh, but um, our chair, um, Councillor Brenda Massey, is her last full fire authority. She's stepping down. Uh, Brenda has um, dedicated many years um, of her uh, dedication and time uh, to public service uh, to local politics. Uh, Brenda has been a valued member of our fire authority uh, for seven years, um, three of those years being our chair, um, and two of those years also being our vice chair. And in true uh, tradition, we'd like to just recognize uh, Brenda's contribution and support, uh, hugely grateful for Brenda's support um, since she became chair and also her time on the authority uh, to me as her chief fire officer uh, and also to, to the wider service as well and um, how she has been able to lead uh, the authority uh, through the various meetings. So as I say in true traditional form I've got a, a presentation and a um, a service commissioned medal um, in recognition of uh, de uh, Brenda's um, dedication and commitment. Thank you. It's usually me handing out certificates to the new, new recruits, so that's lovely. It makes a nice, nice change. Could I possibly just briefly echo what the Chief Officer has said. I did actually, Brenda, pay tribute to you amongst the other retiring members at Bristol City Council last Tuesday. You went there, I believe. But I did highlight the contribution you made splendidly to his safety and the fire service in Haven. So we appreciate that. You'll be very relieved. I did describe my Bunch the various retiring members into different categories. Free Labour members I described as big beasts. You'll be pleased I didn't include you in that category. <laughs> I shall have to watch the recording. <laughs> I was actually at the dinner that night. So that's why it was a toss-up between which one to go to. So... I thought I'd go and represent you all. <laughs> you know, a choice between a full council meeting. It was hard. It was hard, that one. <laughs> um, and, yeah, okay, I've got one more to do, but shall I do that one first? Yeah. Um, the other person who we know is definitely standing down is Councillor Philippa Hume. Who... Oh, no, Andrew Varney is also... Oh, right, and I understand Andrew is also standing down. All right. It's going to be a bit of an exodus in Bristol, isn't there? What do, what do we know that you don't? Yes, right, OK. Can I thank everybody for your service? You, you, it's been really welcome and very valued. And sounds like they've started cutting the grass again. But, yes, we really do appreciate your time um, helping here. It's been fantastic working with everybody. Right. Um, I've got to work out. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, Ben, you did, didn't you? It's OK. Um, I'd just obviously like to put on my record the thanks to the members that are standing down. You play the valuable service um, during your tenure. But I would like to put on record my thanks to Brenda. The vice chair in the chair role isn't always the easiest um, relationship in the world, but you've made that relationship as easy as you possibly can do. And... You know, um, I know that you know, we won't have so many late night telephone calls anymore in terms of arranging things, but it's, um, it's been fantastic to work with you and I wish you nothing but the best of luck in the future. Thank you, I really appreciate that. And I am going to miss you all. Members, there's one other person in the room who is its last full fire authority meeting, uh, which related to one of the papers later on in the agenda. Um, and that is my, my colleagues at to my right here, uh, who I know who uh, will not thank me for this at all. 
Um, but that's Assistant Chief Officer Steve Emery, um, who has uh, decided to retire uh, from a very, very successful career in the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, we've still got some time, um, certainly, to, to work with Steve. Um, he doesn't retire until the end of May, but it's linked to uh, one of your papers. But I'd like to place on record, on behalf of members, my thanks um, to Steve uh, for many years dedicated uh, public service um, and as a firefighter, um, many years spent in Bath um, as, a, as a local lad in Bath, uh, but more importantly, uh, certainly over the last few years and since I became your Chief Officer, the support and counsel that Steve um, has provided to myself and other board colleagues as well. And, and I'll have a few more words to say um, for Steve, um, uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, nearer to the time of his last day, uh, but I'm sure you're joining me in uh, wishing Steve well on behalf of uh, the authority and thank him for his service. I hadn't. But, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. That's good. And obviously, we don't know what the outcomes of the forthcoming elections are going to be in Bristol, so there could well be more changes to come. But I really do, I have thoroughly enjoyed my time on the Fire Authority. We've had ups and downs. Sometimes it felt like more downs than ups. But that happens with anything. And I'm going to miss you all. I'm going to miss that long trek from the car park, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not. <laughs> anyway, for anybody who's not remaining on the authority, and you've got one of these badges for headquarters, can you give it to Emma at the end of the session, please? That'll save her chasing you. So, yeah. Right. Is there anything else on that? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Right. Okay, so we can now move on to the main body of the meeting. And the first item is to accept the minutes of the ordinary meeting of the Fire Authority held on the 19th of February this year. And I move those as a correct record. Can I have a seconder? Thank you, Richard. Is everybody happy with that? Just a correction. Um, I think at the end it shows the meeting finishing at 12 o'clock which was very worrying as a new member when I wondered how long these meetings were going to go on for. That was 12 midnight. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, it was a morning meeting, not an afternoon meeting. Yes, I think that was right. Emma, are you able to check? It did finish at 12. Yes, I believe that is correct. I know they're normally afternoon. It was just the budget meeting was a morning one, which was unusual for us. But thank you. You can, you can be relieved now. Votes in favour. Yeah, I did try. Uh, can I have votes in favour? Please show in favour of the minutes, please. The correct record. Super. Yeah, I think everybody was there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and the next one is uh, number seven, which are the minutes of the ordinary <coughs> meeting of the local pension board held on the 10th of July, 2023. And I'll move those for noting as they've already been approved by the local pension board. Richard, you're seconding? Yes. Thank you. So, everybody okay with that? Yeah. Great. Just, just by way of explanation, the reason they're so old is they only meet twice a yeah. year and they had to approve those minutes in January. So, that's why it's come to the next available meeting. Right. And we now move on to item eight on the agenda, which is the 2024 2028 service plan including CRMP and I can't remember what CRMP stands for. Community. That'll be a community risk management plan. Right, thank you. Thank you Chair. Members, the paper in front of you uh, pre <coughs> presents to you our service plan for 2024 to 2028 and you'll note there are two recommendations in the paper. The first recommendation is to consider the outcomes of public consultation and the second is to approve publication of the service plan content for the years 2024 to 2028 following design and development of the new web-based service plan. Before we run through the report today, I'd firstly like to thank the officers involved in putting the plan together um, and that many of those officers are in front of me now. Um, so Scott, Natalie, uh, Lee, um, Amber, 
Caroline and also Helen, who can't be with, with us today, who have worked extremely hard, along with other members of their team, to get a service plan to this position that we present to you today. So in regards to the service plan, as I say there, it's a four-year service plan. In essence, it's a document that sets out over, our overarching strategy, strategic priorities uh, to our communities. It is the only plan which covers a full range of our responsibilities and is an important tool to help focus our efforts and resources on the right things. It's even more important in the context of constrained budgets and rapid change. By prioritising a clear set of commitments, the service plan and its accompanying action plan also helps our communities to hold us to account for our performance and challenges, challenges as to continuous improvement. Members, our service plan is in essence two documents in one. It outlines our risk methodology, which identifies the risk profile of our service area and highlights who, why, what, where and when somebody is at risk from fire or other serious incidents. And it sets out how we are going to address and minimise the potential risks to members of our community and visitors to our service area, which they may be exposed to. The plan includes our vision, our mission and our values, as well as our two key priorities, one of making our communities safer which we do that through prevention, protection, response, and providing a resilient, resilient service. The plan also includes our commitment to making our service stronger through investing in our organisation and investing in our people. I'll now hand over to Scott to talk you through the process we've been through over the last year to get us to this point that we present to you today. Scott. Thank you, Simon. So, members, each year the service conducts a comprehensive planning process, and this is to consider community risks uh, in line with our service key objectives. This allows us to best match our resources to risk. Our service planning process is also integrated with our financial planning, so this allows alignment with our medium-term financial plan. And this approach allows the service to consider changes to the financial landscape and adapt our priorities and actions if necessary, while maintaining a clear vision and purpose. As part of this year's review, the duration and uh, format of the service plan have evolved. We now have a four-year non-rolling service plan that allows the service to adopt a more strategic and longer-term vision, as well as increase how efficiently and effectively we implement the plan. Following last year's feedback uh, and discussion with members, the service is developing a more detailed action plan with smart objectives <coughs> to support achievement of our service plan objectives. This work also includes enhancing the systems, processes and reporting in place to ensure and maintain progress. This week, the service launched our new avonfire.gov.uk website. The content for our 2024-28 service plan, which is included for you in Appendix 1 on page 31 of your pack, is, in this, is currently in the latter stages of design and development, and this will be ready for publication on our new website in April. As part of the development of our plan, service leads and officers developed and refined our objectives based on horizon scanning to identify community risks and areas for improvement. We have also collaborated with other fire and rescue services and continue to work closely with these to ensure that our service planning process is aligned with best practice across the sector. Efficiency and effectiveness are key themes for the service and this plan aligns with our ongoing journey of continuous improvement to ensure that we continue to execute our core activities excellently. At the same time, work has been undertaken to refresh our baseline data and strategic assessment of risk, an update on our key assumptions and findings identified by the Community Risk Management Planning Team were provided to members in September's Policy and Resources Committee meeting for your review and feedback. And following this, the draft service plan objectives were presented at December's PRC meeting where members were able to offer their feedback prior to public consultation. So that's a brief overview of the process that we've been through to get to where we are today. I'd now like to hand over to Lee, who will talk to you in a bit more detail about the community risk management planning process. Thank you, Scott. Good afternoon, members. Uh, my name is Lee Alford. Um, just to reiterate some of Simon's comments and Scott's mentioned already, that our service plan incorporates our community risk management plan. So why do we have a CRMP and what are we aiming to achieve? So Section 21 of the Fire and Rescue Services Act 2004 requires the Secretary of State to prepare a Fire and Rescue National Framework. Under the Fire and Rescue National Framework for England, we have a legal requirement to produce a publicly available community risk management plan. This plan must cover at least a three-year time span, and as we are proposing a four-year plan, 
as you are already aware. The plan must be regularly reviewed and consulted upon and it must reflect up-to-date risk information which is also publicly available via our new website. It must also explain how our fire and rescue service plans to use its resources and reduce harm and risk within our communities. The Community Risk Management Plan is aiming to identify and assess all foreseeable fire and rescue service related risks that may affect our service or our communities. It also incorporates the allocation of appropriate prevention, protection and response resources to mitigate those risks efficiently and effectively. To identify and assess risk, we follow the National Fire Chiefs Council Community Risk Management Plan Strategic Framework Process. Bit of a mouthful. This aligns with the best practice as set out in the fire standard for community risk management planning. We have worked proactively across the industry and with those services defined as outstanding in this area to ensure that we are the best that we can be to support our communities and produce a comprehensive but agile service plan. The Community Risk Management Plan and business planning teams work together very closely to analyse and understand what internal and external influences may affect us as an organisation. We then work to identify risks and potential hazards to our community through several methods. Horizon scanning for emerging risks. Uh, we do lots of uh, research and development around currently lithium-ion and battery energy storage systems and how we look at managing those risks within our communities. We carry out regular reviews of the National Risk Register and the Local Resilience Forum Risk Register and work closely with our local resilience partners. We carry out analysis of our incident data to look for trends and potential shifts in demand. And we have different reports which are publicly available, as Scott has already mentioned, in our baseline. We carry out risk modelling, which is combining demographics, insight data and incident data to pinpoint areas of risk and vulnerability and we match our resources to those risks accordingly. With the, acts lines, uh, with the actions even outlined to achieve our six objectives can be found on page five of the consultation report. Am I on the right page here? And I'm on the wrong page. <laughs> so, sorry Amber, I've cut in on you slightly there. So our risk information is presented to the Service Leadership Board and Strategic Leads who set out their proposals for strategic objectives and subsequent plans for balancing the risks, challenges and opportunities against our vision, mission, values and available budget. By continually consulting with our communities, our staff and our partners on our proposals, we can ensure transparency within our planning process and adjust our plans where necessary and raise awareness of our work. Thank you very much for your time. I'd now like to hand you over to Amber who will talk through our consultation process and the mechanisms that we use to consult on our service plan objectives. Thank you, members. Good afternoon, members. So we ran an eight-week consultation period from the 21st of December 2023 to the 14th of February 2024, which was predominantly carried out through an online questionnaire. However, hard copies and copies in different formats were made available on request. The survey, which was designed and aligned to the Communications and Engagement Fire Standard, set out multiple questions asking for views on our proposed service plan strategic objectives and actions under our six key objectives. There was also a question in relation to community satisfaction and our budget. We would like to just take the time to thank all members of the community, our staff and our partners who took part in that consultation. In total, we received 453 questionnaire responses this compares to 444 responses received last year. We do recognise this is a still a very small percentage of the population served by Avon Fire and Rescue Service. It equates to approximately 0.02%. However, this is comparable to the response rate of other fire and rescue services who engage in consultation. There is a fully integrated approach to reach and engage with as many people as possible and as many of our key stakeholders that have been identified as part of the process. You have the full details of the methods of communication used within the consultation report, but to give you examples of a few, we went out for feedback using local media outlets, across our social media platforms, using Twitter and Facebook predominantly, and by directly email, emailing our staff, partner agencies and our community contacts. Overall, 77.3% of respondents strongly agreed or agreed across our six key objectives. 
Further details of the percentages of respondents that agreed with the actions outlined to achieve our six objectives can be found on page five of the consultation report, which I believe is page 65 of your pack. While the consultation feedback hasn't fundamentally changed the overarching objectives, it has been extensively considered and will support and inform the underpinning action plans to deliver against these objectives. We recognise there are limitations to the level of engagement and responses we can achieve within the consultation timeframe. Therefore, we will continually seek opportunities to further engage with our staff and local communities throughout the delivery of our 2024 to 2028 plan to capture the views and feedback throughout from our communities. So members will consider acknowledged feedback received throughout the service planning process, which has culminated in where we are today and the presentation in front of you today of the service plan for the next four years. Based on key findings, analysis and the consultation process, our service plan objectives have been thoroughly reviewed and updated for 2024 to 2028, and we have updated the plan's narrative in relation to key challenges and community risk findings. Updated performance metrics and key financial information, and also recent service achievements. You will see from the papers presented to you today, that as part of your service plan papers, there are two appendices presented to you. Appendix 1. Uh, which is uh, page 31, is a service plan content for 2024 to 2028. And Appendix 2, from page 61 of your pack, is a service plan 2024-28 consultation report that Amber's just talked us through. Members, this is your plan that you hold me to account to deliver on your behalf and how we deliver our services to our communities. It's how it's going to meet our community expectations based on the risks that we have identified and I put the service plan to you, members, for any questions you might like to ask to the team or myself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard, and then Paul. I've got one question first, Chairman, and then a general comment. Um, Simon may recall I've asked this before, but I think it bears actually checking. I do have a planning hat on in Bristol, and under protection strategic objectives i just i know we always have to uh, look at resources best value uh, look at best value but with the number of post-covid planning applications coming forward do we still believe we have enough resources to properly respond to planning applications Yep, certainly. So plan and are one responsibility of our business fire safety team, of course. Um, and over the last 12 months, a part of the achievements uh, from the last service plan was to introduce um, what we would call a, an enhanced risk-based um, inspection program, which also sets out how we form our team, the number of resources we need to meet that risk, which includes the other responsibilities such as planning, um, applications, enforcements, etc. Um, so we are confident that we have um, the right size of the business fire safety team based on risk-based analysis. And also what has also helped us to achieve that is um, a grant funding to be able to get us um, to what has been um, an, an increase of over 100% of the team size itself. Fine. Can I thank Simon for that response? That's as I understood the situation, so well, I'm grateful for you confirming that. Um, very briefly, because I know we're in questions, but frankly, I won't need to add my comment afterwards. Um, it may surprise you to learn, Jem, but I do have a bit of a reputation for being a bit provocative. And um, the other week I did describe a certain council, Bristol Council consultation, is the council listens, then it ignores. But to be fair with Avon Fire, um, I've always found the way we consult and not only the way we consult, but then the way we seek to implement the findings of that research, uh, authentic and actually incredible. And it looks to me from reading this report and hearing the presentation as if we have carefully uh, taken that on board. So my congratulations to the officers. Um, obviously, there will always be the financial conundrums 
Um, and in fact, later today, we'll end this meeting with discussing some, but that's separate to actually the service plan we have, which I believe broadly reflects our aspirations and the issues and concerns of the people in Haven. Thank you, Councillor Eddie, and credit to, to the team that's worked incredibly hard to get it to this point, so thank you. Paul? Richard stolen my point, but there you go. I was just going to say thank you to the staff and officers that have prepared this not inconsiderable uh, report and made it comprehensible for simple folk like us. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like this. I, I, the, the, the content that we've got, and I appreciate it's not in its final form um, yet, but I think it's, I, I like, it, it flows logically, it makes a lot of sense, and I think the level of detail in there is, is, is just about right. It tells people what they need to know. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing it online as a real live thing, but I think this is a, a massive step forward from what we've had before with the printed book. Plan. So yeah, congratulations to the team. I think it's a really, really good piece of work. Um, just one, one clarification on the consultation report. Question eight asked people whether they think um, we provide value for money, and it looks in here as if 25% of people don't think we're providing value for money. I'd say to those 25%, what do you expect for 10p a day? Um, but was have I read that right, or, or are they were they don't knows? Or was there any indication in the survey responses for why people think that? If, if you look on um, the question eight, it's the majority think we provide value for money. It's 74.4%. Yeah. That, sorry, is that, did, did I not say that? Sorry, that's, that's what I meant. So that suggests a quarter of people don't think we're providing value for money. I'm just interested in... That seems like a fair chunk. Yeah, so in terms of the way that the question is written, it is black and white in that respect. Um, they are linked to the questions sort of before and after in terms of whether or not they've experienced us as a service, but you're absolutely right, and it's something we probably should explore a little bit more. Yeah, I'm just interested what, you know, as I say, what do you expect for 10p? But... <laughs> <laughs> there we go, you can't please all the people, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd also just like to reiterate my thanks to the team for this, this report. It's really clear, and thank you very much for that. I had a question about response rates, uh, which I think Amber's basically answered. I want to know how it compared to other authority areas, um, and you've mentioned that. But it, obviously it is very low. The trend is in the right direction. I'm just wondering what more you can do as a team to get more uh, response, uh, responses next time round. I mean, do you have discussions about this? Do you have a plan in mind? I'm sure you do. No, absolutely right, and you've covered all of the main points, really. Each year we try and build on our response rates and increase what we're doing, take the learning and the feedback that we get from here and feed it into the consultation process. It's why we sort of capture respondent data to understand who and how we're targeting and how we're getting them on board. It's really difficult as well because we, anecdotally, people just tell us they just want us there in an emergency, and how do we capture that and get them to really understand that we want them to answer these questions uh, for the, to inform the longevity and the sustainability of the fire service. So um, we do all that we possibly can. We have a, obviously our sort of bare minimum and then what we can factor into that time frame in terms of different communication channels, reaching out, members of the team phoning round to different people. We're, we're willing to sort of try anything and everything to get those responses. So we're Although it is low, as you say, um, we are maintaining that and hoping to build on that year on year. So. Okay, any more comments? Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry if it's already in here and I've missed it. What did you find the most successful method to get um, people to reply to? So it's a, it is a combination, um, social media, social media, we can really look at targeted advertising to different demographics and we can set up the formula in order to target different areas of our community um, and that gives our biggest sort of reach and response rates. Um, we also have mailing lists 
um, of subscribers, of people who contact us for service information. And again, that is another popular way of getting responses. Any other comments? No? Okay. Um, this is for noting, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we've Sorry. So if I just read out the recommendations. So the fire authority is asked to consider the outcomes of the public consultation, which I believe you have already done. Um, but what you're asked to vote on now is to approve the service plan 2024-28 content in Appendix 1 for publication in April 2024, following design and, re and development of the new web-based service plan. So can I have a proposer for that? Stephen Byrne, thank you. Okay. Okay, so anybody I'm trying to remember if st abstentions or against. against against is first, that's right. It always feels back to front. Right. Any abstentions, please? No. Any against? No. Those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you. Good. Right. Um, okay, members of balance. Uh, this is the bit you'll all be interested in, <laughs> except me. <laughs> I'm going at the wrong time, obviously. Right, I'm handing over to the clerk to talk about your allowances. Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is paper nine in your PAP members, so on page 73. Uh, it's my report to you about your members' allowances scheme. So you will realise that every year we're in, required to refresh your, um, your scheme. So I've got a bit of echo on this. Um, what we've done this year, in light of the governance changes... Has anybody got their microphone? Anyone still got their button on? No. No. Let, let's keep trying. Is it not too bad? Is that okay? Okay, good. All right. Right, lovely. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Okay. So, in the light of the governance review which we had last year, which changed the structure of the fire authority, although we weren't due to have another independent review at this stage, we have gone ahead with that to make sure that your scheme reflects the new governance arrangements. So, the recommendations of this report, um, which I'll come to again at the end, but it's to consider the report of the independent expert that we've instructed, Bryony Holden, who's the Chief Exec of South West Councils. That's at Appendix 1. She's made 13 recommendations. So I'm asking you to consider her report on those recommendations. I'm then asking you to approve the draft new members allowances scheme for 24-25. And I have assumed that you want me to incorporate her recommendations. So I have incorporated those figures into that document. If you decide you don't like her recommendations, then we will go through and delete the relevant bits in the members allowances scheme. And then I'm asking for approval to publish that new scheme. So if we just quickly touch on the report itself, so I'll come back to the financial implications um, at the end. But under the legislation, we are required to publish a scheme for you. Um, we are only allowed to do an automatic index for increasing those allowances up to four years. So every four years, this has to be reviewed. And as I've explained, your last review was undertaken in November 21. So it wasn't due for a while, but we have undertaken that review early. So if I refer you then to paragraph 5.6 of my report on page 76, what I've done there is I've taken out of Ryan's report her 13 recommendations, and I'll quickly run through those with you. So the basic allowance for members has increased slightly. That will be 3,156. She's recommended that we keep in place the policy of only having one special responsibility allowance in addition to your basic allowance. So just one extra allowed on top of the basic allowance. The chair's allowance is going to increase to 14861. Sorry, Brenda. 
As the poorest paid chair around. I know, I know, I'm sorry. Um, recommendation four is that the special responsibility allowance for the vice chair is probably the biggest difference. That is almost doubling uh, to 6899. And I think uh, absolutely right to reflect the work that's being done. And paragraph 6.13 of the report explains that our current um, allowance for that post is the lowest of any combined fire authority in the research. So I think we're, we were quite some way behind. So that's why it suddenly feels like a big jump. Um, the only people who've lost out a little bit is the um, group, political group leaders. Um, that has reduced slightly, not by a large amount, but in, in most of the southwest local uh, fire authorities, it's not paid at all. So it's trying to reach that balance between not paying versus paying and getting the amount about right. She has decided that at this stage, no special responsibility allowance is required for committee chairs because those roles are fulfilled by the fire authority chair and the vice chair automatically. And no special responsibility allowance for committee vice chairs at this stage because she couldn't find evidence of sufficient duties to, to mean that that was needed. However, she has said that should be kept under review. So it might be that we decide differently in future. She has also recommended the introduction of a new local pensions board allowance because you're, the two members who do that role have to undertake quite a lot of pensions training. It is a very technical role and my thanks to the two elected members who've been taking the pain uh, of that role for us. Um, they will get a very small basic special, special responsibility allowance of £473 a year. So sorry, Andrew, just too late for you. Okay. Um, Recommendation nine is that we continue to use the, the annual flat rate of the NJC Green Book Pay Award, but for the avoidance of doubt, that won't apply this year. It will start from next year, because this is your review at this stage. Um, she has approved the rates paid to the independent person, James Mason, and the new independent member for AJOC, which is good. Travelling expenses are going to be the same, and uh, the next review will be in four years' time. Advisory recommendation 13 is just simply, yes, I acknowledge the independent review and you should have a regular training programme for members. So I'm looking to introduce that for you and hopefully we'll have a paper at the AGM about that. So the details in Appendix 1, um, the benchmarking, she's used um, the South West Group, Dorset and Wiltshire and Devon and Somerset Fire and also local authorities with broadly sized similar populations as her benchmarking group. I don't intend to go through the detail. I, do, I don't think there's any need. Um, she's not here, it's just me, so be gentle. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions before we recap the recommendations. Thank you. Andrew Varney. I didn't actually plan to speak on this, Chairman, but something Amanda said just prompted my query, so I may have misunderstood you, Amanda. Assuming the same constitutional setup relates to this as to our unitary authorities, um, I didn't believe we were able to take a pick and mix approach to the recommendations. I thought we had to either accept in totality the independent panel's recommendations or reject them. I think it's slightly different here because we don't have a panel. So we've just, we've outsourced this work to an independent expert. She hasn't said in her report that everything has to be accepted in total, but I can clarify that with her. My view was that there was nothing there particularly controversial and that the likelihood was that members would probably just accept. You accepted all her yeah. recommendations last time, I so I didn't ten, ask her that question. I agree with you, Amanda. I certainly don't have an issue with any recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. That's very helpful. Councillor Varney. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, I just want to endorse recommendation um, eight. Um, the pension board members, they only have two meetings a year. They're no longer public, and one of them is online. But there is quite a lot of reading and training. It is quite technical. So I think this allowance is a fair sort of reflection of the extra additional workload that they have. So thank you very much for introducing that. I know we talked about it previously, so thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Wilcox. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
looking at uh, paragraph 6.24, which is talking about committee vice chairs, the recommendation 7 talks about uh, no responsibility allowance should be paid to committee chairs. I think we need to add a word vice there, please. I, I think, yes, I spotted that typo because it's in her summary of her recommendations, but not in the body. I think there was a typo, so I'll insert that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? No. So I think we've considered the report. Um, so what I need from members is whether you're happy to adopt the 13 recommendations and whether you're happy to approve the draft members allowances scheme 2425 at appendix 2 in which I've already incorporated those figures and then uh, approve that, public, that member scheme to be published. So if, can I have a proposal? I please? move all recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Eddy. And a seconder, please. Thank you. Any votes against? Any abstentions? Votes in favour? Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Okay. And our next item is item 10, the updated 2024-25 revenue budget and MTFP. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, so this paper um, is bringing you today uh, the updated revenue budget for the next financial year and then the medium-term financial plan for the four-year period. So following the meeting on the 19th of February of this year, um, a member raised a proposal um, that this paper aims to address. So we're presenting here today several options to try and address that proposal and the implications of those options. Um, paragraph 3.2 uh, at the bottom of page 105 of your bundles just outlines what that uh, proposal was. So the proposal was to look at whether we could remove uh, the £500,000 contribution that we proposed in the revenue budget to the capital programme and therefore avoid the requirement uh, to generate sufficient efficiency savings so we could delay our efficiency programme to 25-26. Um, just moving on to some of the other background items. So the, we're presenting the medium-term financial plan here again today as part of this paper because the medium-term financial plan was presented in February but for noting only, uh, acknowledging that depending on the outcome of this proposal, there would be a slight impact on the medium-term financial plan as well. So that's within this paper today. Um, paragraph 3.5 um, of your bundle just references that we have only made changes to assumptions within the budget and the medium-term financial plan that are detailed in, in section 4 of the paper. So any other assumptions that were made as a result, uh, as part of the budget setting process and the MTFP process, remain unchanged. And the final kind of element of background to this paper before we go into the options is around the budget shortfall paper that was presented to the authority back in October last year. So the, uh, the, the presentation of that paper um, was approved by the authority for the continued development and implementation of a crewing model that reflects four personnel on every pumping appliance at whole time stations. That was um, expected to generate around two million of recurring annual savings. Um, based on our latest view, we think that that kind of efficiency plan is likely to generate well, one, around 1.8 million of recurring annual savings now. All of the options that I'm presenting for you here today um, require over £4 million worth of savings by the fourth year of the medium-term financial plan. So it's just really to highlight that those efficiency plans that have previously been approved only really go to less than half of the way that we need to. So there's still, still other, we still need to find a route path for the remaining savings requirement. Moving on to section four of the paper. So this is where um, each of the options are uh, outlined in a bit more detail for you. So Although it's going to be slightly, I'm going to try and not make it confusing, what I want to do is reference through to the capital paper, so paper 11 of this uh, meeting as well. I'm going to reference through to some of the uh, appendices as I talk through the impact of each option because um, some of them have an impact on what the capital programme looks like and I just want to make sure that we're clear around what that, what that looks like for each of the scenarios that we talk through. So option one, um, it, it, which is at the bottom of page 106 of your bundles, is the option that was presented at the previous meeting. So this is where we are still proposing to have the £500,000 contribution from the revenue budget to the capital programme for 24-25, and we're looking at needing to make or generate um, savings of £625,000 to balance the budget. And across the four-year medium-term financial plan, savings requirements for around £4.1 million. So Appendix 1 to this paper, which is on page 121 of your bundles, just outlines uh, what the, medium, the revenue budget for next year and then the four-year medium-term financial plan looks like in that scenario. 
If we look at the capital program under that scenario, we can see that capital program on page 157 of your bundles. Um, and the one thing I just wanted to point out there is so that we can then see how that moves depending on the other options. Um, we can see in the top box, the top section of the top box for 2024-25, we can see that £500,000 contribution from the revenue budget to the funding element of the capital programme for next year. And we can see that the total capital programme is just over £34.3 million. And we'll just see how that tweaks depending on the other options that we look at. So option one is our recommended option today. Um, it allows the service time to deliver the £4.1 million worth of savings. So we've got a four-year um, window to be able to work up to that saving plan. So it gives us the opportunity to gradually introduce those efficiency changes to so those crewing changes. If we look now at option two... Uh, presented within the paper. So this is the option that we looked at to remove that contribution from the revenue budget to the capital programme. By removing that contribution, we're reducing the amount of efficiency savings that are required to be made in 24-25, and the assumption then is that those crewing model changes will be delayed until 25-26. As a result of removing uh, the £500,000 contribution from the revenue budget to the capital programme, we've identified three sub-scenarios within this option for how that will impact the capital programme. So the first option or sub-scenario within option two, uh, option two one, which is at the bottom of page 107, um, is around reducing the capital programme by £500,000. So what we're saying here is that we're going to take £500,000 of funding out of the capital programme effectively and we're going to reduce the investment that the service makes accordingly. So it makes no change to the borrowing assumptions within the programme. This means that there's no additional costs uh, in terms of cost of capital, so capital financing costs. They're, they remain the same. But what it does mean is that we have to cut our capital programme. Um, this option, by doing this, we're, we're working, as I said, to delay efficiency savings to 25, 26. So we would need to make a, a small nominal amount of savings in 24, 25 to balance the budget, but we'd still need to make 1.4 million pounds worth of savings in 25, 26. And I just wanted to highlight here that those savings, the way that we are, the assumptions that we make is that those savings are recurring annual savings. So if we were looking at option one and identifying just over £600,000 worth of savings in the first year, when we move on to 25, 26, where we need to make £1.4 million worth of savings, we've already, we're already £600,000 of the way there. So there's only £800,000 worth of new savings to identify for that year. So when we look at option two in these sub-scenarios, each sub-scenario assumes we've we're not making those savings in the first year, so we have to identify the full 1.4 million in 25-26 in, in order to balance the budget. So that's just a, a harder, um, a, that's a lot harder for us to do. And then what it also means is that the total savings, so the 4.1 million, has to be identified within a three-year period rather than a four-year period. So compressing that time period. Um, for those reasons, that isn't the option that we're recommending here today. Firstly, because of the compressed time period that I've just mentioned, and then also because the, of cutting the capital programme. So in order for us to do that, for the purposes of this paper, um, we've illustratively adjusted the capital programme, which we can see on page 157 of your bundles. Uh, no, sorry, 159, um, which is Appendix 3 to the capital paper. So we can see that the contribution from revenue has been removed. And what we've just done is removed £250,000 each from premises and fleet within that first year of the programme. That's just for illustrative purposes. Um, and I've mentioned in the paper there in paragraph 4.10, for us to really remove something from the programme, we would have to complete a detailed risk assessment to identify what that would be. The second option um, within option two is to rephase the capital programme. So what we're saying is we would keep the total capital programme the same, but we would shift £500,000 to spend from 24-25 into 25-26. So that would have the benefit of not bringing forward borrowing. So we would, we would still need to borrow more because we're reducing the funding and not reducing the capital programme, but it still means that we don't have to borrow until 25-26. So the impact of this would be additional capital financing costs going through the revenue budget. It's around £40,000 a year on, on a £500,000 loan, assuming an eight, around an 8% cost of capital. Um, and again, for the purposes of, of this scenario, we've outlined three possible ways we could rephase the programme in paragraph 4.13 there for you. So either rephasing £500,000 from the fleet programme or, or rephasing full £500,000 from premises or splitting that between fleet and premises. And, and within that section of the paper, it just outlines the kind of things that might be affected uh, if we do that. For the purposes of, of the capital programme, which is shown on page 161, um, we have... Oh, modelled the third option there. So we've modelled a change in, of £250,000 in both the fleet and the premises lines. What we can see is that the overall capital programme remains unchanged at £34.3 million, 
Um, but that prudential borrowing has increased in 25-26 by £500,000. Again, this isn't an option that we're recommending here today because it still has the impact of compressing the time frame that I talked about within that first option in um, that first scenario within option two. Um, and there obviously is an impact on our capital program of delaying investment there. Um, the final scenario within option two, the third scenario, is not changing the capital program at all. So the capital program remains as it was under option um, one. But what it would mean is that we would still need to borrow more in order to fund the capital programme in full, and that borrowing would be brought forward. So if we're not rephasing any of the spend, we just need to borrow earlier to be able to deliver that programme. Um, so that, again, would have an impact of increasing capital uh, financing costs for the um, four-year period, so increases overall efficiency savings that are required to be made. Again, it's a relatively small impact. It's slightly larger than under the previous scenario, but still around £40,000 a year. Um, but it has the benefit of not affecting our capital programme. Um, but again, this option is not one that we're recommending today uh, for similar reasons to the previous two options, really. The compressed time frame, it does increase the savings that are required to be made over the three-year period, albeit only slightly, but it's still we're, we're, asked, we're having to save more and in a smaller period. So, so it's not an option that we're recommending today. The final option is option three, um, which is on page 111 of your bundles. Uh, and that is another option that we've explored where we wouldn't remove that contribution um, to the capital programme, but we'd find another way that we could potentially balance the budget. And what we've proposed as part of this option is to release um, or utilise some of our earmark reserves to balance the budget. So we've identified there's £425,000 within an earmarked reserve um, we've called the Investor Save Reserve. Um, we are proposing to release that reserve and also to slightly tweak the capital programme to just remove £50,000, which has been allocated to the transformation programme. This has a result of reducing the efficiency savings for 24-25 to £155,000 and the impact of that is still, um, the, the suggestion would be we wouldn't pursue the efficiency programme during that year, we would look to put, put delay again until 25-26, so similarly to option two, all the scenarios within option two. Um, as this option doesn't affect borrowing at all, we're still looking at 4.1 million uh, total savings over the four year period. Um, and again, we can see the impact of this in Appendix 5, which is on page 129 of your bundles. But I also want to draw your attention to Appendix 6, which is on page 131 of your bundles, which is the um, reserve position. So this um, illustrates what we think the reserves, or what we're expecting the reserve, the reserve position to look like as at the 31st of March this year. Obviously, we're not quite there yet. So this is an expectation, not, not actually where we are. Um, highlighted in yellow for you is the investor save reserve, so that's the £420,000 that this option is proposing to release. Um, just looking at the reserve position, we have around 2.9, just under 3 million of earmarked reserves expected at the end of March this year. So that's what we expect the opening position for 24-25 to be. Um, if I can draw your attention to the previous um, appendix, which is on page 129, we can see that the transfer from reserves, which is the very bottom line on that budget, um, is just over a million pounds. In previous scenarios where we weren't proposing utilising reserves, that was around £670,000. So it's a, it's a big increase. And what I just really wanted to draw your attention to is the release of over a million pounds of just under three million of reserves takes our reserves to below two million pounds. Um, expected level of reserves um, for March 2025. And what we've tried to do here is just have a little look at how that compares to other services, which we've done in paragraph 4.32 of your papers. And it just suggests that we, we're already holding relatively low level of reserves in comparison to other services that are of a similar size. And if we pursued this option, we'd be bringing ourselves to well below a 10% limit. And a limit on reserves is something that we would choose to set ourselves, and it would be different for different services, but it's just something that we wouldn't feel comfortable doing. Um, so again, for that reason, this isn't a recommended option. The other um, thing to note with reserves is you can only use them once. They've been earmarked for a specific purpose, and you can only use them once. So once we've utilised them, we won't be able to use them again. And given the pressures that we're under with the fun, uh, in the revenue budget and balancing the budget in future years, we're unlikely to be able to contribute to those reserves in future. So it's, it's going to be much more difficult, difficult for us to build those up again. And having a lower level of reserves just redu reduces our financial resilience. So we've highlighted in paragraph 4.35 there just some examples of where um, there, are, there are potential costs that we haven't been able to incorporate in the medium-term financial plan yet because we don't know what they are, but they might be coming. And if we don't have sufficient reserves to support that, we might not. It just it reduces our resilience to respond to those. 
So again, mainly for the reasons around reserves and the fact that it's delaying and, and compressing the time frame over making the savings. Option three isn't uh, one that's recommended here today in this paper either. Moving on to section five. So section five of this paper aims to cover the kind of non-financial and more operational impacts of, of delaying um, the efficiency plans. So this, the comments in this section are really relevant to options two and three presented within the paper rather than option one. So the decision that was made at the October Fire Authority meeting um, was to continue the um, development and implementation of the alternative crewing model. And so the service has begun to make plans already to put that in place, assuming that it was going to start uh, during 24-25. The service was planning on using a natural reduction in, in establishment um, to achieve the efficiency savings through retirements. So at the top of page 114 of your bundles, we've got a, just an illustration of a couple of different projections around um, a retirement profile. And that retirement profile suggests that anywhere between 34 and 60 retirements across the four-year period might be expected. What we need to consider is delaying the efficiency plans means, means we need to think about how we are going to maintain the establishment levels during 24-25. So we're expecting, say, between 9 and 13 retirements during that year, and how are we going to be able to maintain establishment during that period if we're not implementing the efficiency savings? So paragraph 5.8 at the bottom of page 114 just gives four, four um, options that we've considered around how we would maintain establishment during 24-25, should we go with one of options of two or three. So things we've considered are running a training school. And as I mentioned before, because of the previous decision that's been made to continue to develop and implement these crewing changes, we're not able to run a training school now until February 2025, which is very close to the end of the 24-25 financial year. So it would give us nine or ten months of having to manage um, a, a kind of fluctuating um, establishment level. And if we then chose to permanently appoint more, more firefighters towards the end of the year, we'd then be looking to go into 25, 26 and immediately starting to reduce those again. Um, the effect of that might be that we have to look to, to redundancies to um, manage the establishment levels over the, th the remaining three-year period of the programme. So again, it just reflects on that compressed time frame that there are, there's, a, there's a chance that the retirement profile that we can see here on page 114 wouldn't be sufficient to achieve the efficiency savings that we need to make. We've also looked at permanent transfer from on-call to whole time. It has a similar impact, really, if we're permanently appointing staff. We still run the risk of redundancies. We have got some staff that are, are eligible to do that at the moment, but it's unlikely to be sufficient to totally bridge the gap um, between the level of retirements that we're expecting. In both of these scenarios, we have to think about how we would manage a reduced level of establishment potentially for a period of time during 24-25 as well. So there's also the chance of additional overtime costs. Um, the, the, the other, another option we thought about is a temporary transfer from on-call to hold time, which would avoid that kind of permanent appointment uh, issue, but is unlikely to be very attractive, really, to the firefighter, so it doesn't really feel like it's going to be a viable option. Um, and the final option, again, that we've considered is recruiting from other fire services, and again, it's looking at permanent appointments, so we're still running the risk of having to look at future redundancy uh, programmes to reduce the establishment to the level that we need to achieve. And of course, a redundancy programme comes with associated costs which aren't included in the medium-term financial plan assumptions at this point. So kind of to summarise, really, both options two and three um, would put us in a position where we're more reactively managing establishment. Uh, we're looking at potential redundancies and potential overtime, so both additional costs there that are not included in the uh, medium-term financial plan, and also looking at potentially a more frequent usage of the degradation plan, so bringing appliances off the run if we have a shortfall of resources. So all of that combined with the shorter time frame to achieve the savings that we need to make. Whereas if we're looking at option one, we're looking at kind of a proactive um, controlled and phased introduction of efficiency plans to help us um, bridge the gap in over the four-year period. Um, so really, and we've already seen really from looking at the financials, the impact um, of each of options two and three on the overall savings is relatively minimal. It's more around that compressed time frame and, making, and putting the service under far more pressure to deliver those savings over a three-year period rather than four. The final... Um, element of this paper that I wanted to just draw your attention to is the section 25 statement. So that's on page 118 of your bundles. So the section 25 statement is something that I am legally required to make as part of the budget setting process. And the full section 25 statement was published um, in the February papers. So what we've done here is just um, added some comments of, of how um, 
Our opinion, or my opinion on the Section 25 statement has changed based on the options presented for you here today. So, obviously, option one is the option we presented in the previous meeting, so the Section 25 statement remains unchanged under that option. Option two, um, really there's a caveat here with kind of commenting on the robustness of the budget setting process under option two because option two puts us in a position where we can balance the budget in 24-25 and we've seen there are ways that we can do that but it's putting significant amount of pressure on future years so it really kind of puts into question whether that is a really robust way of uh, setting a budget and then under option three um, we've talked about how that's going to really put pressure on our reserves and one of the elements of the section 25 statement is the adequacy of our reserves levels so I think in this scenario I'd be unwilling to um, kind of sign off the section 25 statement on that basis and I think that brings me to everything I wanted to say on that paper so I'll open for questions <laughs> thank you chair um, so I've got a comment to make and then an amendment okay um, obviously, I've spoken to a lot of members over the last week or so, the chair, group leaders. Um, I've also spoken to the officers. The options on papers there, none, none of us want to make this choice. They're very difficult choices to make. But quite frankly, we need, a, we need a budget today, and we need a budget that works and is workable for everyone. Now, and obviously, I've spoken to the FBU over the last week, both locally, regionally, and and nationally. So I'd like to put forward an amendment, if, my may, if I may, which has been circulated to group leaders. If, if you ha can I just check, has everyone received a copy of it? Has everyone received a copy? Because obviously I don't want to move it unless people know what they're voting for or against. Um, I only have one you Yeah, you that's the, earlier, one, I, well, the one I gave to you. Okay. So for the benefit of the record, this is the amendment, which I've spoken to Simon and Verity, and they're both happy with the wording on. So uh, the amendment is the officer recommendation, and then the, then the below the amendment is if significant funding is identified and received from central governments, or if there's a substantial increase in council tax base, or a significant decrease in deficit, the Avon Fire Authority will commit the chief fire officer to the following actions. One, efficiency savings are immediately paused and reversed. Two, the chief fire officer will present a new and updated plan to, the emerg to an emergency meeting of the Avon Fire Authority to reflect the increase in, in significant funding. Uh, the Avon Fire Authority notes the following one, the work of Councillor Steve Smith in regards to his option two. Two, the ongoing lobbying campaign of the FBU, the Fire Brigade's Union, for fair funding settlement to the fire service. Three, the difficult situation that fire services and fire authorities find themselves in with the uncertainty around the continued one-year funding settlements by central governments. Obviously, this isn't a perfect amendment, but it does give us wiggle room down the future line if there is an increase in funding. There are so many different variables which can happen this year. Um, we don't know where we will be in three months, six months' time, let alone in a year's time. This gives us the ability to actually, if things change, we can change. If things move, we can move. We have the ability to keep control within this, authority, within this uh, board to actually hold the Chief Fire Officer to account if circumstances change. The only difference is that in terms of the officer recommendation, we still keep the officer recommendation, but it gives us wiggle room down the line if things do change. And I think this, this is the, a middle ground for us to work from. This isn't the end result. It's the first stage of a many stage process as we go across the, the rest of this year. But I think it, for the time being, it might be a solution. Can I just second Councillor Nutland's uh, amendment? And I'll reserve my remarks at the moment just to hear from other members. Thank you. I was just about to ask for a one, so you preempted it. That's fine. Um, I had uh, Steve and Richard indicated they wanted to speak. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. And as the, the troublemaker who asked the question at the last bu last budget meeting, um, and I can first say th thank you very much for this this report. I know a lot of work has has gone into this, and you've given us a clear set of options um, here and some really clear information. Um, I, I've only been on, on this authority a couple of years, I've not been around all that long, but I haven't yet in those two years gone against an officer recommendation. Um, and it's something I, I've thought a lot about and agonised over over the last couple of weeks, but I, I am going to. Um, my suggestion to, to colleagues is that we don't support the recommendation in this case, and instead we choose option uh, two, brackets three. Um, and I just want to be very clear at this stage that going against that recommendation does not imply any criticism or any lack of respect for Verity or for Simon or for anybody else. That's not, not what it is at all. For me, it's simply that when we approved 
the uh, efficiency plan back in October, I think it was, we approved it subject to changes in the funding position. And the funding position, for this coming year at least, has changed. Um, the medium term financial plan we looked at this time last year forecast a deficit of just over a million pounds. Was it 1.063 from memory? Something like that? <laughs> um, by the time we got to December last year, we had the update report on efficiencies. We were expecting a deficit for 24-25 of just over £2 million. Fast forward two months, funding settlements come out, um, council tax base helped us out a lot, and the deficit, without making that transfer to capital, is £125,000, not £2 million. Um, and for me, that does make a difference. So we said the efficiency plan, the, the crewing changes, were the least bad option. Um, and I think you know, that, that was a view that most people shared, and that we, we, we were doing it reluctantly, but didn't want to do it if we didn't have to do it. And my suggestion is that, for this year at least, we don't have to do it. However, there is a risk to that, and I'm not pretending this is, this is simple uh, and everything's going to be okay if we just carry on. Um, the risk is that if, if the forecasts in, in the current medium-term financial plan are correct, then this time next year we're looking for 1.4 million, and in a few years' time that goes up to 4 point something, 4.2 million, I think it is. Um, and I don't shy away from that, that we, you know, this choice isn't going to go away, it'll come back, and it gets harder. If we don't do it now, it gets harder later. And I haven't yet seen any less bad options than the one we've got in front of us. So I, I, don't, I just want to be clear that I'm, I'm not suggesting that we can just ignore it now and it all goes away and everything will be fine. Um, however, situations do change. And we've seen that this year, that we've gone from a million pound deficit to a two million pound deficit down to 125,000 pounds. Various things changed that, that got us to that point. I'm not a blind optimist. I, I'm not. I, I certainly wouldn't, um, wouldn't put a lot of money on a £4 million deficit just melting away. But things do change, and a lot could change over the next few years. So my preference would be that we give ourselves that time, and we accept with that comes the risk that if the deficit does come back to bite us next year at £1.4 million or whatever it might be, those cuts will be harder this time next year than they would be if we did them now. But personally, set against needing to to cut posts now, that's always personally that I'm prepared to take. Thank you very much for that and uh, just to echo what's been said, uh, the finance officers, there's a, a lot of work gone into the report here and I really appreciate the dire situation in terms of funding that we're in. Um, I think I'm not quite sure where we're gonna go with the vote on it because I think uh, my preferred option as it stands and reading it last night was two brackets one. So we've got a two brackets three and Ben's amendment. I think I, I'm sympathetic with the amendment that's come through but it, it's all sort of centers around a big if and if it's basically option one with, a, with an if funding comes in in coming months, which we know, don't know what's going to happen further down the line, but uh, whether, th whether things are going to be able to change that quickly overnight, we, we, we don't know. Um, in terms of um, some of the questions I had as well, uh, in reserves, I think there's probably the, the you mentioned reserves, and we sit both at the start of the meeting. And uh, I saw on page 112, 4.32, we're carrying about 12%, I think, uh, I think it mentions. Um, I know councils only tend to hold around about 5% as their sort of guideline, according to previous budgets, sort of debates that I've been involved with. Um, I know we're kind of perhaps comparing app apples and pears a little bit. We're a different service. Um, but there's a, there was a government directive, I just just wondered if there was a bit of scope in that, perhaps. Um, there was a government directive that came out not that long ago, a few months back, which basically told councils to use more of their reserves. Um, I don't know if that sort of stretched to fire authorities as well. Um, obviously, from, from my point of view as an opposition member, that's really an excuse for the funding shortfall sort of thing. Um, 
a, a government minister is likely to say, but we are where we are. So I just wondered if we could maybe look at that a little bit more. Um, and the only other point I was going to make about was about uh, Nottinghamshire Fire Authority example. I saw with interest that they had quite a good sort of collective compromise, I suppose. Um, and they were able to put a lot of their cuts and um, reduction operational cuts on hold. Um, so I just wondered if we could perhaps, if anyone knew a little bit more about that um, and how they managed to get to that position. So just in relation to Nottingham Fire and Rescue Service, I, I'm not cited on the finer detail of that councillor, so I'm unable to comment on that one, I'm afraid. Okay. Sorry, Ian, I'll, I'll add a little bit on the reserves there. I mean, I think there has been pressure for fire services to reduce reserves in the past. Um, but we don't hold particularly uh, large reserves as a service. We do have a general reserve, which we haven't talked about today. It's 1.5 million. That's around 3% of our um, net revenue budget. Um, and then we've got our earmarked reserves on top of that, which we specifically put aside. I think, I guess, the levels of reserves are uh, whatever the, the, that specific authority feels comfortable holding. And I think, I mean, my opinion is that ours are already relatively low, and to kind of reduce them further would be... Uh, potentially not the most sensible thing to do, but I, I think it, I don't know if we can compare with, with um, kind of councils. But it's it's I think a, a, almost preference and, and what what a specific authority thinks is prudent in their in their situation. So, Councillor, if I may just add uh, to what uh, Verity has said there, some of the reserves that you identified in, in uh, page one through one of your papers, um, some of those. Um, uh, uh, reserves, for example, ESMCP, are ring-fenced reserves, the reserves that we can't move around. Um, they're either as a result of grant funding, as an example, certainly the, the PFI equalisation fund, uh, you know, we can't move that around. The technical fire safety reserve is grant funding that is ring-fenced particularly for technical fire safety and commitments um, in terms of salary costs going forward um, as well um, as part of that. Um, growth, if you like, in the service through business fire safety, as an example, and also the transformation reserve. Um, we've got contracts that uh, that um, are extended to a set date, and that reserve covers the cost of those, uh, the end of those contracts, the salary costs. So, whilst we may have quite a few reserves that you identified, many of them are already ring fenced and already allocated. Yes. Yeah. Okay. On my list, I've got. The other Richard, then I've got Steve and I've got Paul. Just first. Oh, well, I think actually Richard was, and then yeah, Richard. Right. Okay. <laughs> I vividly recall the debate we had on this issue last October, and I recall using almost similar words to actually what Ben did this afternoon that no one around this table wanted to receive this report and to make the green decisions which were being recommended to us, though we were actually obligated, and rightly so, to set a balanced budget. Um, in my view at that time, I believe the officer's recommendation was the were least worst option. Uh, though we made the point of allowing ourselves some wriggle room if circumstances change. I've heard the debate and the officers' recommendations, and again, I echo my thanks for the detailed information available to us. I think my position is best reflected what, what councillor Smith expressed, actually. In my view, the financial situation, even within six months, has changed quite significantly. And even with the caveats and the health warnings Steve has given, I believe actually option two, oblique three, um, is worthy of investigation, of course. And even if I assume Steve implicitly moved his amendment. If not, well, I'm sure he did. I'm very happy to second that, of course. Thank you. Um, Finnepa? 
Hi. And, um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for the huge amount of work that's gone into this and all the detailed information, which was really helpful. I do want to say, though, I come at this perhaps slightly emotionally because um, I know what it's like to lie awake at night um, hoping an emergency worker is going to come home safely in the morning. I know what it's like to wait for that click in the door at, like, quarter past seven, twenty past seven, and you're desperately, everything you're hoping that, you know, your loved one is coming home safely. And I, I know that there, there, there are that there have been tests to show that the, the four-member queue is the four-member crew is as safe um, as a five-member crew, and I'm, I'm sure they were, were done rigorously. But I just think that in real emergency situations, I, I really find it hard to sort of to think that what we're calling efficiency sa savings potentially are. You know, they're people, aren't they? They're, they're fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, daughters, whatever. And I just find it really, really hard. I would really, really want to spend another year really trying you know, to do everything we possibly can to get some more money um, and to take that risk of, of assuming that that will be successful before we go down the, the road of um, cutting the number of crews who are out there. It, it, we're calling it efficiency savings. It's not. It's actually cutting the numbers of people who are out there fighting fires and keeping us all safe. You, uh, Steve? Thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify in, in response to what, what Richard said. Um, the reason for me that the preferred option is 2-3 is that obviously option 1 is what personally I'm, I'm trying to avoid for, the, for this year. Um, and option 3, I, I totally agree with Verity taking that money from reserves wouldn't be sensible. Um, two one and two two either reduce the level of investment in the capital plan or delay it. Um, whereas option two three maintains the capital plan as it is at the cost of some a small amount of additional borrowing. Um, and I think for all the reasons that, that Simon set out in his statement at the start of the meeting, those investments matter. Um, you know, they're not on the plan just because we've got money to spend and hey, let's go and spend it. They're they're important things that, that we need to do. So personally, I'd rather maintain the capital plan, keep those investments, and that's what option two, three does. That's why I'm for that one. Thank you. I've got Paul, and then I've got Robin. It's horrible, isn't it? Um, I wasn't in the October meeting. I, I'd only just woken up from a coma, so I have an excuse. But um, I've listened to, to all sides today. I've got one question, and then I'll make a, a statement, if that's okay. The first question is, is regarding the amendment. So if we don't get any change to funding, option one goes ahead. Is that correct? Okay, so I would say the spirit of the amendment is that if we take the officer one recommendation, which is Verity's legal opinion in terms of how we go forth, it gives us the wiggle room that actually there are so many different variables over the next 12 months. There could be an increase in funding from this government, which is what the FBU are lobbying for. Um, we could have a change in government. We could have a new, we could have reset the relationship with fire across the country in terms of how we're funded in general. There are so many different variables that between picking between option one or option two, three, um, this amendment is, the spirit of it is to actually give us some wiggle room so that if things do change, we can hold the chief to account, which he's happy for us to do. Those discussions have been had. We can call an emergency, sorry, call an emergency meeting of this authority or the next authority, depending on when that new information comes down the road, um, and actually look at, judge things how they are at the time. Because that's all we're doing today. We're judging what the material is today not how we want things to be or how we wish things to be. It's how they are now. And how we are now is that, you know, uh, Steve's done a lot of work on this and his, you know, his option is, it, it is credible for a year. But once again, we will be in the same position, if not worse, this time next year. And the case is that for members who wish to still be on this authority this time next year, we will be making a similar decision, but maybe with worse numbers. Maybe the financial picture changes. Maybe things, you know, maybe the land of milk and honey does come and we can fund fire correctly and we are in a, such a position where we not only, we can reverse these cuts, because that's what they are, they're cuts. You know, they are, you know, you can adjust them up how they want to. It's the line that I gave in October, 
It's still the line that cuts. But we have to deal with facts how, as they are, not how we wish them to be. And I have great concern about going against the officer recommend, recommendation when it's a legal opinion. Also, I have great concern in terms of how we, as an authority, go from a scrutiny body, in essence, to dealing with operational de deliverability. And I think that's maybe one of the areas that we might be crossing here. So I have concerns. This amendment isn't perfect. I'm not going to stand here and say it, it is. But it gives us an option. It gives us an option now to look at things. It also gives us an option if the situation changes. And I don't think that we should handcuff ourselves to one option or the other. This gives us the ability for some wiggle room. It won't fundamentally change what will happen, but if things change, then we can change. So I don't know if that answers your question, Paul, or not, but. Yeah, I think it does. I think it does, Ben. I'm a pragmatist as well, and don't get me wrong. Um, and I, with my apolitical hat on, um, the pachyderm in the parlour, if you, if you like, is that we may well have a change of government, but there may, even with that change of government, um, there may not be any extra funding. Um, I think this may well be the second long-term government that leaves with a note in the drawer saying there's no money left, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so, with all that in mind, I'm, I am a union man, but um, I understand, and I understand the FBU's point. Um, they, are, they have a vested interest, and that is entirely what I would expect them to do and support them in doing that. Um, and on this, I haven't gone against the, uh, an officer's recommendation in all my years on, on the fire authority, um, but I'm with Steve on this one. Uh, I think um, we have to postpone because these cuts are not. We have to find other cuts, I'm afraid, because we can't put firefighters' safety and the public safety at risk um, f just for the sake of cash. And I understand it's, it, you know, devil and deep, you see, it's, it's literally the definition of a dilemma, the choices we have to make today. And I agree that we shouldn't take it from reserves. I, I, think, I think we should just... If we have to borrow, we have to borrow. Thank you. Okay, I've got Robin, then David, then Andrea. Um, thank you. Um, a great first meeting to come in on <laughs> with a decision like this. Um, the, I would say, just as a, as a, as a comment, that, we're anti that there will be a general election. But independent economists are saying any incoming government will have the worst financial situation since the Second World War. So bread tomorrow, uh, whatever, is, is not going to happen. And apologies if, because I'm first meeting, first time look at these papers, it's a new budget to me. And although I'm relatively OK on budgets, it is a new budget. And I'm trying to understand the relationship between revenue and capital and in particular how capital is spent and has an impact on revenue budget. The assumption is, of course, that if you replace uh, old kit with new, then that can bring your, your running costs down, because old kit and whatever. There's also the implication as well, and I've got less problems about using reserves as long as using those reserves isn't to plug a gap selling the family silver as much as it is, is are there opportunities to spend to save? And it's interesting to see that the reserve is in there to spend to save. Although I have to say the definition of it isn't as wide as I would hope, uh, hope it to be. Um, so I, I would guess that there will be some kind of briefing for new members, including myself, post um, the, the, the Bristol elections, but I'd hope as well that budget actually focuses a bit more on how you can actually use capital in order to assist your revenue, um, uh, your revenue situation. And the go on from that, I guess, of course, is it's borrowing money has a cost, but equally can have a, a revenue saving a revenue saving operationally rather than, than, than borrowing. Thank you. Um, David. Thank you, Chair. Um, a 
I've got a, uh, a proposal and a question. So are we going to be taking the, well, actually, I'll start with the question. Are we going to be taking the amendment first and then voting on all the options? Uh, and do the options require a two-thirds majority to pass, or is it simply first past the post? Good question. I was going to take the amendment first because that was proposed straight away. So I suggest we vote on that first because that will determine whether we now need to go on the next stage. And then I was going to take a majority of the room. Um, and I can vote on every option if, if members want me to. Um, it looks like the consensus is that it was going to be option two, three, but maybe I've misread the comments. I don't know. So for me, option two, one probably has the... Uh, has the emphasis because of the uh, not um, uh, taking any investment away from the fleet. Uh, so th th it looks like be... it will mean. Be... Okay. Does it? Oh, well, sorry, the wrong way around. Um, so yeah, I think we do need to take each option as, a, as an individual one. Thank you. Yeah, just a very quickly, a very interesting debate, and it's interesting to get lots of different views. We're normally kind of unanimous in our decision making, so it's quite an interesting uh, uh, day today. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. Just to say, I'd like members to think seriously about uh, Councillor Nutland's amendment. Um, as he said, it's not going against the legal advice that we've been given by our statutory finance officer. That obviously has to be taken very seriously. We can't ignore it lightly. I know Councillor Smith has said he doesn't. Um, so that's really important, you know, and it's clear that the other options are just can kicking. You know, we do need to uh, face up to the reality that we have today. Uh, we can't uh, avoid it. Um, it's unlikely, even with a different government, that we're suddenly going to get lots of new funding. I think that's very unlikely indeed. So rather than just delaying a decision, which will then become a more difficult decision further down the line, we need to make a decision uh, today. And I think the amendment that goes with option one is probably the best um, the best route that we should take at this point. Thank you. I had Ben, but do you want to say something? Are you going to be summing up, Ben? I, I can sum up a uh, comment to make as well. Okay, so I'll let, yeah. I'll let Steve go first. I, I, that's what, to back. clarify the point on, on process, basically. So yeah. if, if we're going to vote for the amendment, are we voting simply to accept that we're amending the motion, or are we voting to accept the officer recommendation? And then we've made the decision that we are going to go ahead with the budget. Yeah, never, never underestimate the ability for a group of politicians to overcomplicate things. But um, <laughs> so, so in, in terms of procedure, uh, in my mind, members, it would be we're voting to whether to attach the amendment to the officer recommendation, as I think Councillor Reddy is agreeing with me now. Um, and then it would be the option to then take the, amend, the amended officer recommendation against the other options. So. For, yeah, to overcomplicate things, it will be the case of whether we accept the amendment onto the officer recommendation. You may decide you don't want the amendment. You might just want to go completely with the officer recommendation against any other option. So that's how I would take it, Chair and Clark, is that to offer the members the opportunity to have the amended motion or just the original recommendation. Fine. So <laughs> I'm, I'm perfectly happy then that we, we vote to, to attach that attach the amendment onto, the, onto option one. In process terms then, we do that, fine. We then had a proposal that we go for option two, three, which was seconded. So I would suggest we then vote on that first. And if that falls, then we go back and vote for... Um, I, 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 so, sorry, here we go. Politicians <laughs> yeah, and procedure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, in, in, my, in my opinion, the legal position is of, of, um, of uh, recommendation from the officer. So the officer's recommendation with the attached amendment is debated. Yeah. We then vote on it. If the officer recommendation is defeated, we then go to the other options on the table. And can I suggest that obviously the consensus seems to be around Councillor Smith's proposal. Unless there's any other recommendation that we would want to debate, we then take that as the proposal. Thank you, Chair. I hear all that because I didn't have my microphone. I've just been told <laughs> off. <laughs> um, I have a question as well. Uh, if the amendment wasn't passed 
and uh, the efficiency savings weren't immediately paused as a result of that amendment. After uh, a period of time, could uh, another item come to a full meeting to discuss pausing those um, so, uh, efficiency savings? I would say that it, this is an amendment as part of the budgetary process, so obviously I think you'd have, probably have to wait to the next budgetary meeting in order to then make a decision. That's why the amendment gives us flexibility. It gives us the flexibility to actually call an emergency meeting if our funding changes. And there are three different ways our funding does change, by the increase in council tax base, by an increase in government, central government funding, um, and also, sorry, I've lost my own, uh, uh, hang on. I think you just said anything that results yeah, in a smaller but, deficit. Yeah, but in terms of actually, you know, so for the record, um, you know, we have three options there. Those three options allow us to call an emergency meeting under those three items. So I would say it's part of the budgetary process, so I, I doubt that we could call such a meeting and, until the next budgetary meeting in order to, to debate. So this is why the amendment gives us the flexibility to actually call an emergency meeting if our funding does change. Otherwise, I think we're going to have to wait until the next budget, budget meeting to do that. Can I just, just clarify uh, uh, what? Dave, David was first. And then Sorry. That's my clarification question. But once well, I just want to re respond to clarify something David said, actually, because you said, David, I think, that the amendment would pause the job cuts. It doesn't. No, efficiency, same. Efficient, well, same thing. But if we, if we vote for the amended option one, we are voting for those efficiency savings to go ahead as of the 1st of April. Yeah. The amendment doesn't pause them. The amendment gives us the option to pull the handbrake on later if something changes. Yeah, so that's, that, that, that's the whole point. You know, it's not trying to pull the wall over anyone's eyes. You know, it is, it is the officer recommendation, but with the attached, that obviously if things do change, then it gives the authority, the ability, the power to then relook at things. You know, there are another amendments to, to what we're proposing today. This is a handbrake so that if circumstances do change, then we can change with those circumstances. Whereas the other two options don't give us that flexibility or that power. It's one or the other, it's black or white. I didn't want to hopefully complicate things, but uh, I, I understand that certainly from what David said, there was a bit of um, wider uh, agreement perhaps that 2-1 might be a, a, a possibility. We certainly got two proposals on the table. If I could perhaps formally move 2-1 as a third proposal then. Uh, obviously, it depends if the others get passed and, and how far down the line we get with that. Um, but uh, I, it sounds as though we might have some scope with 2-1. With but um, I'm prepared to be pragmatic, as Paul rightly says. I don't know if we have a seconder for that. Or... Robin, you indicated, and then... Just, just a, a, again, trying to understand the point of clarification. It's a question for, for the finance officer. The amendment is if things change and, and I think one thing that's quoted is is the council tax base changes what's your view I, I didn't the, the council tax base can't can't I, I think the amendment proposed any significant change to funding and council tax base was one of the ways that might happen so but yeah and my question my question question is is advice to the finance officer I understand what you're trying to do but the examples you're using on how that happen can't happen. So the council they, they can in future years. Yeah. They can in future years, yeah, but we're looking year. at setting so. a budget for the next year. The council tax base is the council tax base. Mm. And yes, that sir. as an example of of light at the end of the tunnel, I'm afraid is someone walking with a torch rather than a light at the end of the tunnel. Nick, I, I think what it's saying is if currently over four years we think we're looking at a £4.2 million pound deficit. Yeah. Yeah. If the council tax base grows more than we expect it to next year or the year after, that £4.2 million pound deficit shrinks. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's what the amendment yeah. is saying, I think. Not that it's going to change in year, as you might say, it can't. Yeah. But yeah. that does mean that you're working on the principle of a budget for next year that is making efficiency savings based on £4.1 mm. not on a change in council tax base later on. 
if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, obviously this is really, really challenging for all of us. Um, can, and I really see what Ben, what your, your amendment and how that can give us that break. However, we did, I'm just kind of putting this out here, and this is, sorry, this is a dyslexics nightmare because we're, we keep talking about numbers here and, and stuff, but if I try and get this right, so if we did um, what um, Councillor Smith was advising and we did 2-3, could we not add an amendment to that to put, put on the break? If it did it the other way, so if we suddenly do actually meet those, yeah, take the break <laughs> off, because if we do suddenly get, um, things do go get worse, then we can bring it back and change it if we can see those the, the you know the costs going up or spiraling um, we can then do it the other way so it's kind of the reverse system so we have that pressure valve however i know that's still not hap helping with the fact that we're going against officer recommendations but it does give us that if this is going really terribly wrong we can bring it back It's a lot of amendments today. Um, no, no, no. Um, uh, what I would say is, is that Councillor Brennan is correct. You know, we, we can attach amendments to anything that we want to. The case in point in the spirit of the, my amendment was that there, are, there have been um, a lot of concern from members concerning the, the direction in terms of how these efficiency savings are going to take place. The mechanism for the amendment to the officer recommendation was to keep the power within the authority if circumstances change. Councillor Smith has proposed his own amendment, which is perfectly valid. It does keep us within one year, but then, you know, there are consequences down the road. You know, I don't want to see us having to put amendments onto absolutely everything because I don't think it serves a purpose. The amendment was fought out, it was discussed with group leaders, it was discussed with officers, so that if circumstances do change, we can change with those circumstances. You know, you can bolt it onto Councillor Smith's proposal if he wants that. You can propose it onto, bolt it onto any proposal that you'd like. It just gave members a di an additional option in terms of how we view the officer recommendation. We still take the legal point of view, but then we also have a backstop, a handbrake, so, you know, if you will, to actually look at things again. That's the point of it. It's not a case of just bolting it on there for the sake of bolting it on there. It's there. It serves a purpose to keep the power within the authority to hold the chief fire officer to account, and that's our, that's our job. Scrutiny. That's our job, not operations. Absolutely. Scrutiny is our job, and we have to be very careful in terms of what we do today and how we view things that we keep that line, because it's a fine line to tread. Okay? Can I suggest, then, having heard all that debate, that we, we look first at option one, which is recommended by your statutory finance officer. So you've got a recommendation from her under section 25 of the Local Government Act 2003. Um, and I remind members that you should have due regard to her recommendation under the legislation in, in your um, voting. So we're going to go with that first, simply because it's the, the recommendation by a statutory finance officer, with the amendment proposed by um, Councillor Nutland. And, and he will remind me if I've got the wording right, but if, can we just say if any significant funding is identified rather than set out all the three categories, um, Councillor Nutland, would that be okay? So, so it would be approve option one, but with the amendment that if any significant funding is identified and received from central government, the Avon Fire Authority commits uh, the chief fire officer to the following. One, efficiency savings are immediately paused and reversed. And two, the chief fire officer will present a new and updated plan to an emergency meeting of the Avon Fire Authority to reflect the increase in significant funding. Uh, and then you simply noted the, the work of Councillor Smith in relation to option two uh, and the concerns addressed by the FBU and the difficult situation that the fire services find themselves in in terms of funding. So, just to be clear then, Amanda, on process, yes. from what you just said, 
we are voting now to accept option one. We're not just voting to bolt the amendment on. With the amendment. No, with, with the amendment. With, with, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes, we're sorry. not voting. We're sorry. not voting to bolt. I think the officers are content to amend yeah, option fine. one so, in line with the proposal okay, made so by council. What, vote, what you're asking us to vote on then? Yes. We're not voting simply to bolt the amendment onto option one. We are voting for to accept option one. Yes. I.e. Yes. the budget has proposed. I with think that, that simplifies the process. Fine. Otherwise, okay. we could be here all, for hours voting that's on That's fine. As long as you're all clear what it is, we're voting <laughs> if on If members all. are content to proceed in that way, so we're voting on option. Right. Sorry, I've now got hands going up all over the place. Right. Thank you. I mean, my expectation is that we would simply take a vote now whether to um, add the amendment to the substantive motion and see if that goes or not. Because obviously there may be some people in the room that would be happy with the officer's recommendation without the amendment. I'm really sorry. Can I, with the amendment, um, we're saying looking for, it was just you said something about if we receive extra funding from the government. So we are changing it slightly from what the free things. But... Are we talking about, you know, because obviously um, Councillor Moss talked about, you know, when we borrow money for capital, actually that can be for investment and return money in sort of other ways. But if we make it really niche, are we, are we not including that way of also maybe finding money? Sorry, am I making it, I'm probably not explaining that well at all. Uh, I believe, actually, correct me if I'm wrong, and I don't want to muddy the. We've just agreed, and Council Nutton's agreed to change it to any significant financial yes. change. Is that correct? Yeah, Fine. That's perfect. I'm I, I think, for the benefit of the record, it's the legal definition in terms of funding. Whether it's, you know, obviously we could, we could completely mess our budgets up and put a substantial increase in from one area to the other. This, the, 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 re the amendment is about additional funding coming in from outside. Okay? So money from governments, you know. So, no, not, not, not within, sorry, that, that's an oversimplification of things, but, you know, not within, you know, in terms of moving one pot to another. It's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I know where we are. Sorry, Ron. Can we be absolutely clear what we're voting on here? Because I'm still not clear. And I've, sat here and, I've sat here and listened to all that. I've made hundreds of votes over my life, but I'm really not clear where we're going here. So, we're voting on option one with the amendment. Or are we voting on option one and then voting on the amendment? OK, hang on. OK, hang on, hang on. So, we're voting on option one or option one with the amendment. Are we then voting on Steve's proposal as well? Because, because we need to know what that is. Let's do it stage by stage. Let's vote on option one as it stands. Yeah, but we're going to have a choice, aren't we? And then we're going to go for option one with the amendment. Chair, I, I have a question. Um, if the amendment is applied to option one, at what point does the senior leadership team start executing um, or unpausing the efficiency savings? At what point do they actually decide that they can start executing them? Well, in essence, if you vote for, if you vote for option one, as is in the paper, um, then as the paper suggests that we'll be able to do, done, uh, and my statement in response to uh, the Fire Brigade's Union statement is it gives us time to gradually introduce them through um, natural reductions in establishment, uh, but also um, that planned approach as well. So it depends on the retirement profile as identified within the paper as to when they will start to begin, uh, but there are a couple of phases uh, to that, and it won't be um, sort of car blanche right on the next day at 8 o'clock we'll go to this level of establishment. It will be where the, um, the staffing profile allows, so it might be a station-by-station station, um, approach from there. But there are a number of steps also that need to be taken before we can get to that point, and that is looking at different policies and procedures as well. So, so that would be like uh, mobilisation policies and things like that, Councillor. Uh, Jane, I think you had your hand up. 
Um, I just wanted to comment on this voting procedure because there is a standard mechanism that is followed in every single organisation I've ever been in, which is that an amendment has been proposed, you vote on the amendment, and then you vote on the thing which will either be amended or unamended, depending on the outcome of the first vote. Let, well, apologies, then. Let's go for that. So let's vote on the amendment which has been proposed by Councillor Nutland and seconded by Councillor Varney. So the amendment is option one, which is approve option one, uh, and you're voting on whether you will accept the amendment that if any significant funding is identified and received from central government, then the fire authority commits the chief fire officer to the following efficiency savings are immediately paused in reverse. The chief officer will present a new and updated plan to an emergency meeting of the Avon Fire Authority to reflect the increase in significant funding. And then, uh, do you want me to read out the noting as well? Okay, it's fine. And then, can I just, just, just to be, I, I completely agree. Um, well, so, okay. so just to be really clear, we are voting now to amend the recommendation. We are not voting to accept it. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's fine. But I want to be clear that we're not, we're not voting to accept option one. We're just voting to amend option one. So, in terms of voting to amend option one, to make it clear, any votes against, please? So, I've got two again, uh, three, three against, okay. Any abstentions? Two abstentions. Votes in favour? Ah, oh, clear majority. One, two, three, four, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Thank you. So we can now move to vote on the amendment. Do you need me to read it again? <laughs> we're moving to vote. We're moving on, on the amended. On the amended option. Yes. So just just to be clear, from what David was saying, this doesn't pause anything. This this option is for the, the efficiency plan to start as of for, yeah. gradually, but as starting as of this year. Okay. So we're now voting members on option one with the amendment proposed by Councillor Nutland. Okay, any votes against? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay. Any abstentions? Votes for? One, two, three, four. Okay. Five. Oh, it's five, sorry. Okay. Thank you. So obviously that wasn't in favour of that amendment. Okay. So what option would members like to vote on next? Well, I, th I think we have a proposal for option two, okay. bracket three. So Steve, you've proposed option two, three. I did, and I think Richard seconded it. Yes. And Richard, you're seconding. So, Councillor Wilcox has proposed option 2-1, and who's seconding that? Richard. Richard. Okay. So, we're now voting on option 2-1, which is... No, sorry, 2-3. Two, 2-3 three. Two, three first. So option 2-3, I'm going to try and get this right, is the... Um, yeah, please. So option 2-3 was the option to remove £500,000 contribution to the capital programme from the 2024-25 revenue budget, but make no change to the capital programme. Uh, so our investment phasing would stay the same. It would just mean that we were borrowing slightly earlier. Um, votes against, please. Any abstentions? So is that an abstention? Abstentions, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Is that six? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven abstentions. Votes uh, in favour? One, two, three, four. 
five, six, seven. Oh, this is going to be interesting, isn't it? Okay. So we've got seven abstentions and seven votes in favour. That's interesting. Sorry? Okay. Okay. Yes, because we didn't have votes against. Sorry, I'm following. I'm following. Okay. It has been a long afternoon. Sorry. Okay. But we now need to vote on option 2-1, which is... Sorry. Sorry. Apologies, I've not come across this confusing voting system before, so uh, we've never had this before. Okay, so you have passed then option two, three. Yes. Okay, thank you, members. Now we now need to move on to the capital paper. Do you want to do it before or after the break? I think we should take the break. Now then after, yeah. Okay, we'll have a ten minute break. Thank you. So if we can restart the meeting at 4.35 yep. p.m. So if we could just mark the minutes, Emma, that we haven't got Councillor Eddie or Councillor Goggin now. I, That's oh. right. Councillor Tucker is still here. But... Okay. Okay, thank you. Right. So, item, so we're on item 11? Yes. Okay. And um, you're doing that one as well? Great. <laughs> right. Can we have a bit of hush and we can get through? Thank you. If you do have to leave because you've got a meeting to go to, and I know some people may, um, just just leave. And we're, if you don't actually say I'm just going to the loo or something, we'll take it you're leaving, and we'll just mark it off. And you've made it such an exciting final full cap full meeting for me. I won't forget it in a hurry. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, okay, so over to you, Ben. Okay, thank you. So we are looking at paper 11, which is page 133 um, of your bundle. So this paper is the capital programme and strategy, and it includes the prudential indicators as well. So the meeting um, on the 19th of February last month... Um, we didn't present this paper at all last month because of um, acknowledging the impact that that proposal might have had on the capital programme. So today we're presenting this for the first time, but the prudential indicators did form part of the Treasury management paper that was presented, and they were, the indicators were presented for noting, and they're here now for approval, again, um, noting the fact that they have been slightly impacted by potential changes in, in the capital programme as a result of the options that have been explored in the revenue paper. There are three um, recommendations as part of this paper. So the first recommendation is to approve the three-year capital strategy, which is in Appendix 1. The second recommendation is approving the appropriate option for the capital programme. So given that we've approved option 2.3 in the revenue paper, that means we're looking at Appendix 5 um, for the capital programme that we'll be approving today, or looking to approve today. And then the third recommendation, again, is uh, proving the appropriate option for the prudential indicators. Um, and the prudential indicators associated with option 2-3 um, of the revenue budget paper is at Appendix 10. So that's uh, the recommendations of the paper today. I wanted to start just by uh, going through the capital strategy first, so in Appendix 1. So this strategy is something that we have to prepare um, in, line with, in line with the SIP for Prudential Code. Um, it is a document that it's a three-year document, um, and it talks about how our proposed capital expenditure and the way it's financed contributes to our provision of services. It makes sure that we take into account um, affordability, sustainability, and prudence in our investment plans. Um, and the strategy helps uh, just looks at things uh, like the governance process uh, over approval and, and monitoring of capital spend as well. So, if I can draw your attention to Appendix One, which is on page 147 um, of your bundle. So, this is the capital strategy. 
I won't go through um, every item in detail, but I'll just pick out a couple of the, the important bits to note, really. So, um, Section 4 talks about capital requirements, so that's specific to us here in terms of the kind of capital makeup that we have in terms of fleet um, and, and uh, premises assets mainly. Section 5 is around project initiation, so that's where I mentioned the governance process. Um, so that talks about uh, um, the, in, uh, the governance process we have over approving spend and then monitoring it thereafter. The capital programme that is presented in section six of this strategy, this actually is aligned to option one um, of the revenue budget paper. So this, the um, phasing and total cost uh, in this, in this is, is accurate, but what we've done is remove that contribution um, from revenue, that £500,000, and brought forward the borrowing there. So there'd be a slight tweak to that, uh, to that table to reflect the option that's been approved. Um, the following sections um, of the strategy talk about the way that we can fund uh, capital investment as, as a service. So we can look at funding from revenue, we can look at borrowing, we can look at utilisation of reserves. As a service, we've been fortunate to have um, a relatively significant uh, capital reserve as a result of the sale of the previous HQ. Uh, what we're looking at over the coming year is, is that reserve being fully utilised. So there's around £5 million of that left. Uh, which will fund the capital programme, the majority of the capital programme for 24-25, and then we'll be looking to borrowing. So where the prudential borrowing section becomes more relevant for us, relevant for us um, in the approval of this capital programme and strategy. Um, the prudential borrowing section at section 9 just gives a little bit of an overview of the level of borrowing we currently have in the service and also the indication that we're, we're going to be moving to borrowing uh, in, this, in this coming three-year period. The final um, section of this strategy that I just wanted to draw attention to was section 18, so the very last section, which is about affordability of the capital programme. So we've seen today that we've got significant um, financial challenges to balance our budget in future years, and a, and a lot of that, not all of it, but a lot of it is down to the additional pressure that borrowing puts on the revenue budget, so the cost of that borrowing. Um, so we need to be really mindful of affordability uh, in the coming years. So the, the fifth bullet point in paragraph 18.1 there talks about an affordability indicator. That is one of the prudential indicators that we publish and, and as part of this paper today. And it looks at the financing costs as a percentage of the net revenue budget. And what we're saying here in that bullet point is that we don't want that to exceed 6%. Um, the indicators are only published for a three-year period um, in this paper to align with the length of time of the capital programme, but we know that we've got a four-year medium-term financial plan, so we need to be really mindful of that fourth year where, where we are likely to be getting closer to that 6%. And it brings me on to the final paragraph here in the strategy, which is paragraph 18.6, which is just an acknowledgement, really, that um, funding our capital investment by borrowing is not something we, that we can do sustainably into the future for, in, in um, you know, forever, we can't we can't look at it that way because we, our revenue budget will not be able to support it. So this paragraph just really acknowledges that we're we're looking at alternative approaches, and, and part of that will be looking at a review of our estate strategy as well. So that's the um, capital strategy. So moving back into the main body um, of the paper, uh, per section four talks about the different options that relate to the paper that we've just looked at. The table at, under paragraph 4.2, again, is reflective of option one in that paper. So the uh, change to the capital programme as a result of uh, option two, three being approved is that contribution from revenue um, will be removed. So the 500,000 that we can see in the proposed funding section would be lower, uh, would be reduced to nil, and the external borrowing would be reduced to just over 29.1 million. But total capital programme still remains at 34.3 million. Um, Section 5, I'm just going to talk through briefly the kind of key elements of the capital programme that we're proposing for you here today. Um, paragraph 5.5 5 at the top of page 138 um, highlights the movements between the previous capital programme that's been approved and the programme that we're looking at today. So the previous capital programme was for 12.5 million and we're looking at a programme today um, of 33.4 million. So a, a really significant increase. So the main increase is there around the premises cost. So we've included um, the cost for the rebuild of Bath and the refurbishment of the Western Station. Those are the most significant movements, really, um, between la the last capital programme and this one. We've also removed um, an element of the transformation uh, budget that's no longer required uh, because that programme is coming to an end in March 2025. We have also increased the, the control allocation um, as a result of the requirement to invest in a new mobilising system, and that's something that was approved at the December Policy and Resources Committee meeting uh, last year. And that, that was uh, approved with the knowledge that the current capital programme didn't support that investment and that the capital programme has been uplifted to reflect that. 
So the current premises capital programme, um, which is covered in paragraph 5.6, just um, kind of highlights the key things that are within that programme. So we've already covered the Bath and Western refurbishments and how they're a big variance when compared to last, the last programme. Both of those are still subject to full, full approval, so they will be coming back to the Policy and Resources Committee meeting um, in July of this year. Um, there's the Bedminster major refurbishment as well. So that commenced in 23-24, is expected to be completed in June of uh, 2024, so the first quarter of 24-25. And there's around £800,000 of spend still to go on that project. The Premises Capital Programme also um, has a general allowance. So there's around £3 million across a three-year period. Um, which is to be informed by the current condition surveys and we're expecting reports to be back by the end of this month but it's likely to include things like on-call station improvements to address health and safety concerns and welfare and dignity um, issues as well as some training facilities, so things like training towers. The fleet element of the capital programme is around just over £4 million. Um, there's a £650,000 investment in a heavy pumping appliance. That contract award was approved um, by the senior leadership, board, the service leadership board uh, in November. And we also have an allowance for four Type B appliances, which have a kind of um, about around an 18-month build time. So there's an allocation of spend in, across both the first and second year of the programme. There's an allocation then within the fleet uh, capital programme for the blended fleet approach. So the fleet strategy is under review. Um, and that revised fleet strategy will inform uh, where the remainder of that fleet investment goes to match our risks, uh, to match the resources that we invest in with the risks of our, of our, service, of our service area. Um, the IT capital programme is at the bottom of page 140, so paragraph uh, 5.18 of your bundles. Um, the allocation for the IT programme is around £300,000 a year. There's, an element, there's a slight element of um, inflation applied each year uh, for the second and third year. This allowance is assumed to cover kind of standard IT hardware replacement, so laptops, monitors and servers, things like that. We have recently run a recruitment process for an IT manager and there's the need for a, a kind of a revised IT strategy. So we do acknowledge that that IT strategy may well impact on the capital programme for the IT element um, and we will need to consider that as that information becomes available. Similarly, we know that there were um, several IT priorities as a part, as in part of the HMIC FRS action plan. We have allocated £150,000 in the revenue budget to address some of those issues which were talked about um, in the February meeting and part of the, the uh, revenue budget presentation. We are just acknowledging here that there could be some capital investment required as well as revenue and again the capital programme will need to be considered and updated as, a, as that information becomes available. Uh, transformation, as I mentioned before, has been reduced. There's only £50,000 in the programme for this year, um, for the first year of the programme, um, which is just for some smart screens on stations. And the final element of the programme that I just wanted to touch on was the control element, which I previously mentioned. So that's increased quite significantly when compared to previous programmes. Um, we've got an allowance of £230,000 for the digitisation of the phone lines, so something that needs to be done uh, by the end of 2025 and something that we need to do um, to ensure that we're in line with our statutory duties. And as I mentioned before, the main chunk of the spend within the control uh, element of the programme is for the mobilisation system upgrade um, with a £2.5 million allocation across the first two years. The final thing I just wanted to um, touch on really were the prudential indicators. So these were presented as part of the February meeting. The prudential indicators you're approving today um, are on page 173 of your bundle. So they're the ones that are associated with option two, three. So they reflect the, the, the capital programme profile and they reflect the associated financing costs. So we can see the uh, financing costs and net revenue stream in there, slightly, a slightly higher percentage than we would see under option one, for example, because the borrowing costs are slightly higher. So those indicators broadly remain unchanged from what we presented at the meeting in February, just tweaked for those slight changes in, in borrowing profile. Um, and then the, the second page of the indicators are the treasury management indicators. They haven't been updated since last time. They remain the same. I think that was all I wanted to say on that uh, paper, so I'll open up for any questions. David? Thank you, Verity, for that uh, comprehensive uh, explanation of what's going on. Um, could you remind members about what time frame we need to make a decision about uh, where the HQ for Aid from Fire and Rescue is located, please? So the current, I'll, I'll, I might let Simon dive in in a minute as well. The current um, PFI arrangement ends in March 2028, so I don't think it could be, for, be before then, but we obviously may have to, you know, so put some plans that's in place. So that's the PFI arrangement for um, Seven Park, isn't it? Oh, sorry, yeah. HQ here. 
Is it, was the question HQ, sorry. There are various break clauses in the HQ, in the contract, aren't there? <laughs> there are, yeah. So in headquarters, as, as I said, there are various um, points for break clauses. What we are looking at is headquarters in the context of um, our plans around um, Seven Park. An update to that is going to the PRC, PRC, that's a blast and pass, isn't it? PRC in um, July um, to give a scope out of where we are with that uh, and, the, and also the potential links with headquarters and also potential links to other rationalisation across our estate because, of course, Seven Park, as has been pointed out in the papers, is currently not included in our kind of financial estimates around revenue and capital and is a potential further cost for us to, to need to fund. So, at the moment, we're only looking at headquarters in the context of our plans around Seven Park. Any other comments? Stunned into silence. Okay, so I will just recap on the recommendation so we're clear on which versions of uh, appendices we're approving. So. The first recommendation is to approve the 2024 to 27 capital strategy, which is included in Appendix 1. The second re recommendation is to approve the 2024 to 27 capital program, um, which is included at Appendix 5, so linked to Option 2, 3 that was approved earlier this afternoon. And then the third option is to approve the prudential indicators um, linked to Option 2, 3 approved earlier this afternoon, which is included at Appendix 10 of your bundles. Do I have a proposal? Thank you, Steve. And a seconder? Well, Richard, I think, was closest. Okay. Sorry, I was just checking. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to Right, so you've heard the proposals. We've got a uh, proposal and a seconder. Any comments, or should we move to the vote? It's obviously been a long, long, long <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> okay, can I see anyone abstaining? Anyone against? And those in favour? Oh, that's unanimous. That's unanimous, then I think. Good. Well, item 12, the clerk, I think. Thank you, Chair. So I'm now going to present to you Paper 12, which is the approval of the pay policy statement for 24-25. So that's at page 177 of your bundle. Uh, so every year you have to approve the pay policy statement, uh, which is in place in time for the financial year, which is going, due to begin on the 1st of April 24. So under the Localism Act, as I set out in the background, we have to prepare this document each year and it sets out a range of pay issues. So there are three categories of staff uh, on the workforce under different terms of conditions and when you look at the, um, the pay policy statement itself, it sets out all those different categories. Okay? The statement must also include the remuneration of the chief officer, the remuneration of the lowest paid employee and the relationship in terms of ratios between those two. So key considerations, um, I've basically referred you to the document at Appendix 1. There are no substantive changes from last year. Uh, I'll quickly run through a couple of sections in a moment. I also explain that because the fire, uh, fire authority is an employer of more than 250 staff, we are obliged to comply with gender pay gap reporting in accordance with the Equality Act. Uh, 2010 gender pay gap information regulations and we will be presenting that information after the snapshot date um, to the next policy and resources committee meeting in July. So if you could turn to page 179 which is the pay policy statement I'll just point out a couple of changes since last year. So on page 180 of the bundle, you'll see in the penultimate paragraph that we've just had announced the Chief Fire Officer's Pay Award for Brigade Managers of 3% from the 1st of January 24. So that, that's happened. That's the known. If you turn over the page to 181, 
Um, the NJC uh, made an award for Grey Book, that's your uniform staff, so whole time retained and control room staff. So um, that pay award takes effect from the 1st of July, so whereas with the Chiefs it's the 1st of January, this one is the 1st of July each year, and a two-year pay award was announced previously, so it was 7% from 20, July 22 and 5% from July 23, but of course it's too soon yet to know the pay award for July 24, so that is the unknown, okay, uh, which will happen during the, the lifetime of this document. And then the remuneration of the corporate services staff, which is under Green Book on one, page 181. Again, they were given a, a pay award, which was backdated to the 1st of April last year. It was a, a significant lump sum, 1,925 for all spinal pay points. And then beyond that, it was an uplift of 3.88% and 3.88% on allowances. Again, the unknown is the pay award for the 1st of April this year because negotiations are ongoing. So, so having just set your budget, there are still some unknowns and some assumptions that have had to be made. Um, if we go over the page, please, to page 182. Um, I did notice a, a typo. So in the second paragraph, it should be that the national living wage increases from the 1st of April to £11.44 per hour, not per house. I'm not sure how the word house got in there. Um, we are a, a real living wage employer, um, and that rate has gone up uh, to £12 per hour. So then the document sets out the current remuneration for the Chief Officer, which I'm coming to in the next paper anyway. And then finally, on page 185, it sets out the, the internal pay comparators, which is probably the main purpose of this document, to set out the highest pay, the lowest pay, uh, the medium basic pay, and also the ratios, which are currently the ratios are set out there at paragraph 6.2. So um, I don't think I have any other explanation on that, but happy to take any questions. Thanks, Manor. Just, just to, this is Councillor Eddy's normal question when we do this in Bristol. Um, can you just confirm that we don't have any off-payroll contractors who are part of our regular workforce? Perfect. Thank you very much. Sorry, who else was? Thank you, Chair. A um, question about uh, paragraph 6.2, the internal pay comparators. Um, it talks about a ratio between the chief fire officer and a competent firefighter is 4.5 to 1. What is the actual salary of a competent firefighter, please? I can see my, the finance manager tapping away on her laptop, so maybe she can retrieve that. I think it is this one. I think it's this. 36. So it's in the document. Uh, £36,226. It's at the bottom of the bullet point, the third bullet point in section so that's, 6. Point. that's the medium basic pay? Okay. Thank you for that clarification. You're the finance manager is not suggesting we have incompetent firefighters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we it just go. Means they're not. They've completed their training. They're in development. Any other questions? Any more questions? No. Okay. So uh, my recommendation is that you approve the pay policy statement for 24-25 for the financial year beginning 1st of April 24 for publication. Can I have someone move that, please? I'll move that. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Any votes against? Any abstentions? Votes in favour? Thank you. That was Ben. Thank you. So, again, another paper from me, I'm afraid. I apologise. Paper 13 
on page 187. So this is the annual review of remuneration of the Chief Fire Officer. So uh, again, this is a paper which is presented to you every year. Um, in fact, last year it was presented to you late. You may remember last year that we couldn't have this paper because the pay awards hadn't been announced, but actually they have been announced this year, so that's nice to know. So that you are being asked in this paper to note the National Joint Council Pay Award for Brigade Managers for 2024 of 3% on basic pay, which was announced on the 25th of January 24. And also to note that the Chief Fire Officer does not seek to engage the two-track approach, which allows for a local pay award on top of the national award. So in terms of background, um, again, I will brief you on the Gold Book, Terms and Conditions, which apply to Brigade Managers. Um, I've set out there the relevant section, which sets out this two-track approach. Um, but it... The, the Chief Fire Officer is not seeking to engage that. And under key considerations, I refer to Appendix 1, which is the letter from the National Joint Council setting out the award that they have made. Um, at paragraph 5.2, I attempt to explain the banding that applies to Chief Fire Officer's pay. So Avon Fire and Rescue Service is a band free service. Uh, we are still... Court. I was just going to say, oh, are we yes. yeah. One, two, three, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, we're more than, we're over seven. It's fine. <laughs> That's fine. Okay, okay. Just so, don't argue with Amanda. Okay, okay. So, let me short, short circuit this paper. So, have you got any questions, please? No? Are you happy to note this paper and the pay award? Thank you very much. That's our paper done. Right. Okay. Next, we have paper 14, which is the annual review of service charges. So, Claire, I'm sure, can be just as quick with this one. Absolutely. So, this is an annual paper. Um, so, we have legislated charges, which we can make. Um, we don't do this very often. It does tend to be if we have um, expert witnesses um, in court that we make these charges. But this paper is just about the review of those charges and we've increased them in line with the 5% increase on um, Greybook Pay Award, which is the same methodology as we used last year for the increase. So it's not anything different to what we have done previously. So we're just asking to approve the charging structures that are set out within the report at appendices one and two, and also that power is delegated to the chief fire officer um, to remit the whole of the part, all parts of the charge, if in all circumstances he considers it appropriate to do so. Because like I say, although we can make these charges, um, it's quite rare that we would choose as a fire service to do that. So that's it, really. Unless there are questions. Any questions from anyone? No. Richard. It's only really if um, commercial companies choose to um, use our services. It, obviously, it, it, we tend to put the charges in, and, and, and even then, we tend to be a bit. Uh, I'm not aware of us charging for anything other than mm. when we've been part of, um, like I say, we've provided expert witnesses or been part of an investigation mm. whilst I've been here. So. Remember previous debate, sorry. Thank um, are we voting on this? Do you want to propose? Yeah, I'll propose it and Ben's seconding. Okay, can I see any abstentions? Any against? And any for? <sighs> That's unanimous. They're all getting desperate to go home now, I can tell. <laughs> Me as well. <laughs> all right, we say so. Okay, the next one is the CFO and Clark to present the appointment of new Assistant Chief Fire Officer.
Yes, members, paper 15 on page 201 of your bundles. You're being asked to approve an advert and job description for a new Assistant Chief Fire Officer, approve the selection process for a new Assistant Chief Fire Officer, and approve the commencement of the process to appoint into that position. So, as you heard earlier, Assistant Chief Fire Officer Steve Emery has given notice of intention to retire from the 31st of May, and then we, therefore we will have a vacancy from the 1st of June. Under the amended terms of reference for the fire authority, which was part of the independent governance review, you do establish a selection panel, which undertakes that process with the, the chief fire officer, and they, that panel is consulted in advance of the chief fire officer making that appointment decision. So it's more a sort of advisory role since those changes. Um, I don't intend to go through the detail. There is an anticipated timeline at paragraph 5.6. I do say very much it is anticipated because we're still in the planning stage, um, but it's hoped that we will have presentation and interviews for those who are successful in the earlier stages, so we will review how they perform, and that will be aimed to be about Monday the 3rd of June. So, so we're going to put this timeline in the advert so that people have an idea of, of the dates that are likely to apply. Um, the salary set out in section 4.1 is a percentage of the Chief Fire Officer's salary as agreed previously by the Fire Authority. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. Stu. Just one on timing, Amanda. The interview's 3rd of June with the Fire Authority panel. The Fire Authority's first meeting of the new council term, as it were, is the 12th of June, which means at that point local authorities, and particularly ours, might not have appointed members to the fire authority yet to form a panel. Can we just assume that those who are carrying on can just do it? I, yes, I think, I think when I looked at that, because I realised that was a problem, particularly for Bristol, was I was maybe going to speak to the chair who herself is from Bristol and say, would you mind if I select a panel from the other three UAs so that we have that continuity in place? So, but but recognising that even if an appointment is made on the 3rd of June, that person's going to have to give notice and won't be available for some time afterwards. But yes, if, if that's OK, if the members from Bristol don't have any objections, that's how I would approach it. Other questions, please? Yes, Liz? Sorry, just, um, just being out of interest, do you go internally first and move people up, or is it just out there? Okay. It's open advert um, for all those that are eligible to apply. Um, so as soon as we um, put it out there, then internal and external uh, are invited to apply, so we don't have any staged approach. Any? Any? Okay, okay. So, on that note, then, you are being asked to. He said that message to himself. Yeah. So, could I ask members to approve the advert and job description, approve the selection process, and approve the commencement of that process? Um, any votes again? Oh, are you happy to propose? I'm happy to propose. Ben yeah. will second. Okay. Um, any votes against? Any abstentions? Votes in favour? Thank you. And then I think, bearing in mind how long the meeting has gone on, members have indicated to me that they invite me to adjourn the performance appraisal panel meeting, which was going to take place after this one, as an exempt item on the agenda. So those three members, thank you very much for indicating that. Um, Chief Fire Officer was willing to go ahead today, but I think we've all had a long day. So I think I will reschedule that, which will mean we won't need to go into exempt session. No, that's fine. Good. I think that's the end. So that's the end. Well, thank you all very much for staying here. Um, the next meeting will be Wednesday the 12th of June at 2 o'clock, and it will be at Hicksgate Fire Station. So for new people, um, that will be very interesting for you to see something a bit different. I will be thinking of you. I will think about how long do these meetings go on? No, no time at all, really quick. It's all down to inefficient chairing, that's what it is. Anyway, thank you all very much for coming tonight, and I hope to see you, well, I'll see some of you once more before everything finishes, because we've got uh, a meeting coming up, haven't we? So, thank you.
and good night.